Um, welcome. Uh, we would first start like to recognize any um, elected officials that might be in the audience. If you would stand, if you are in the audience. Welcome, to, uh, uh, Mrs. Harper. Or, I'm sorry, <laughs> Senator Harper. Thank you. Um, we have an uh, we have a quorum, and I would like to get uh, the students from the School of Science and Math at Vanderbilt to come forward and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And welcome back to our student board members, uh, Ms. Bowling and Mr. Eo. Eo. I'm going to get that right. <laughs> All right. We're going to start with our student board member report. All right. Good evening, board chairperson, Ms. Bate, Ms. Mays, um, board vice chair, Ms. Shepard, Dr. Register, and fellow board members. Um, for our first report, we would like to focus on the current Teens Making a Change activities. Um, one activity that they participated in was an interactive group discussion, and it was led by the MNPS coordinator of school counseling, Ms. Lay Bagwell, on the district-wide school climate results. Students reported on what things were, are working in schools that support a positive school climate and those that need improvement as well. The complete report will be compiled and presented at another designated time, and I believe Marquetta. Good the afternoon. Others. We follow this with a leadership session for our newly developed TMAX student advisor group led by MNPS SCC program manager <coughs> Beverly Cruel, Mr. James Flat, and MNPS family outreach spe specialist Manny Annual on Evolve, Evolve, Engage, Engage, sorry, and Empower. We continue, continue our discussion around school climate with a session led by MMPS Director of School Counseling, Ms. Nicole Cobb. We will have our full Team Mac training on November the 29th at the Nashville Youth Opportunity Center to develop our action plans that will focus on students contributing to a positive climate through building level initiatives. And our TMAC meetings are held at the Nashville Youth Opportunity, Youth Opportunity Center on the fourth Thursday of each month, unless otherwise designated, sorry. Thank you for allowing us, us with this opportunity again. Thank you, thank you both, thank I you. appreciate that. And if you would uh, make your um, reports available to Ms. Cameo so she can add them to our minutes, I would appreciate it. Thank yes. you so much. Um, next, we'll have awards and recognitions. Um, Mr. Steele. Good evening, Madam Chairperson. Uh, it is my honor tonight to talk to you about the National Siemens Competition in Math, Science, and Technology Award recipients. I'd like to introduce Dr. Angela Eads, Director of the School, in Science, the School of Science and Math at Vanderbilt University, who will introduce you to a few of our students and their special achievement. After Dr. Eads' presentation, I'll make a brief presentation to the students and give a photo op. Dr. Eads? Good afternoon, Dr. Register and members of the board. I am the Director of the School for Science and Math, now in its sixth year. This is an exemplary partnership between Metro Nashville Public Schools and Vanderbilt University. We are grateful for your support. I would like to introduce and thank Dr. Virginia Shepard. She is Professor of Pathology, Microbiology and Immunology, and she's the Director of the Vanderbilt Center for Science Outreach. She is the one who had the vision for this unique program and has um, led its implementation. I would like to briefly describe some of our recent successes and introduce you to some outstanding students. 
The SSMV is a four-year high school program. Students apply as eighth graders and commit to attending classes on the Vanderbilt campus one day a week for their high school tenure, and this includes summer sessions. Completion of the program earns students seven honors elective credits, and we have now had two graduating classes. These 41 graduates attend co top colleges and universities, including Stanford, MIT, Yale, Davidson, Middlebury, Haverford, and Vanderbilt. Currently, we have 96 students representing nine MNPS high schools. SSMV courses are led by PhD instructors, and scientists are immersed, students are immersed in an interdisciplinary, research-centered curriculum that connects science, technology, engineering, and math. A hallmark component of the curriculum is an internship where, as juniors, students are matched with a Vanderbilt research lab and become a member of a professor's research team to complete an independent research project. Students work through the summer and into the fall semester of their senior year on these projects. They are then written into a scientific report and submitted to national science competitions. In October, our seniors apply to the National Siemens Competition in Math, Science, and Technology. This prestigious competition judged 2,225 student entries and chose 322 semifinalists from 32 states. Tennessee has 10, including four MNPS students who are participants in the School for Science and Math. So including previous classes, there have been 12 MNPS students recognized in the past three years, and we have also had five semifinalists in the Intel Science Talent Search. This is resulting in grants totaling $5,000 awarded to their MNPS schools. Combining the results for both competitions, the SSMV is tied for 17th place nationally out of over 500 submitting schools for having 17 recognitions over the past three years. These are this year's semifinalists, which I would like to introduce to you. With me today are Zach Anderson, Abby Goyle, and Basra Gungor. Jacob Seeloff is not here because he's representing Hume Fogg on the basketball court. He worked in the Biological Sciences Department with Dr. Kathy Friedman, and the title of his project is Examining Sequences that Stimulate Telomere Addition Following DNA Double-Strand Breaks in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So I'll now ask the others to come forward and tell you what MNPS school attend they attend, what laboratory they worked with, and the title of their winning project. Hi, my name is Bashar Gangor. I go to Martin Luther King Magnet High School. Um, I worked in Dr. Moses' laboratory over the summer, and the title of my research is um, Uncovering the Role of TGF-Beta and BMP um, in Triple Negative Breast Cancer Stem Cells. Hi, my name is Abhinav Goyal. I go to Hume Fogg Academic Magnet High School. I worked in Chi Zhang's lab at the Department of Pharmacology at Vanderbilt University, and the title of my project is The Culturing of Neurons on Graphene Transistors for High-Resolution Scanning of Processes. And my name is Zach Anderson. I'm a senior at Hume Fogg. I worked in the Department of Mechanical Engineering under Dr. Jason Valentine. Uh, the title of my project was Reflection and Transmission Measurements at Variable Incidence Angle of a Zero Index Metamaterial. Thank you. Very impressive. Um, <laughs> now, doc, Dr. Shepard and um, Harvey were going to put me on the spot to see if I could explain that, but I, I thought about putting you on the spot. Uh, no, we won't do that. Uh, but on, on behalf of the Board of Public Education and Dr. Register, I want to present these certificates, these students with certificates of achievement. So, um, um, Ms. Mays and Dr. Register, if you'll come forward. Do you want them all together or separately? Also, like if your parents are in the audience, if you'll please stand so we can recognize you, and I'm sure you're very proud of your sons and daughters. Also, 
So thank you to Dr. Shepard for having this vision and for um, Vanderbilt University for allowing our students on their campus. Thank you. And I will say, uh, Mr. Still, to the students, Zachary said that uh, they found out that none of them are the, win are the winners. I would completely disagree. They are all winners, and they should be very proud of their work. Thank you guys again. Uh, Mr. Carr. Uh, Jay Spencer, Cynthia. Chair Lady Mays, Dr. Register, members of the board, this is a, a really neat opportunity for me to get to stand up at the beginning of the meeting because that's when the fun stuff happens <laughs> and, uh, and recognize some people out of our school nutrition um, department, which has been doing some really um, wonderful, exciting things. Um, first, I would like to introduce Jay Nelson, who retired as our uh, school nutrition director this summer but agreed to stay on while we conducted a nationwide search for uh, a new director. Uh, Jay came to Metro in 2003 um, from Wilson County. He was in private business before that and comes from a family of uh, uh, restaurant, restauranteurs and uh, food service folks. And under his leadership, um, we've increased participation in breakfast and lunch above the national average of the Council of Great City Schools, which are other districts um, that are comparable to ours. He um, led the implementation of the point of sale technology system, so now kids can use their IDs and their PIN numbers uh, and parents can keep money in accounts. Um, and it's a very successful thing. It makes life a lot easier. Um, for parents. With the assistance from Alignment Nashville and nearly $100,000 in grant funding, um, it's been used to train staff and improve nutrition and that's been a, a recent kind of thing and the work in that committee also received um, a top three award for nonprofit entities in the state of Tennessee um, in September of this year. It was, it was quite an honor. We have 21 schools that are participating in the USDA Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program and also, uh, and this was recognized today, um, MNPS school caf cafeterias have received two gold, five silver, and 40 bronze awards for the USDA Healthy School Challenge. And um, that's the, the largest number in the state. And we're very proud of that and wanted to take, I wanted to take this opportunity um, to thank Jay in front of the board for his leadership and what he's done uh, with the school nutrition department. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce to you uh, Mr. Spencer Taylor, who is uh, again after a national search our new school nutrition director. He has been on the job for four weeks now, or this is his fourth week. Um, and he uh, brings 20 years of food service experience to us, the last 13 in his hometown of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, in addition to his food service leadership, um, he's also a major in the United States Army Reserve, active currently. Um, where he's a registered dietitian and uh, food service advisor for the 5th Medical Brigade. And we took our time uh, because uh, Jay graciously agreed to, agreed to stay on. We took our time uh, finding Spencer and are really excited to have him um, on board. Spencer, did you want to say anything? Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Register. Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm uh, very happy to be here. I'm glad I was selected. <laughs> and uh, I'm really uh, glad to, to be here and have the opportunity to build on the work that Mr. Nelson has, has laid forth for the department. Uh, I think that I'm coming into a great situation. I've already seen a lot of bright spots and met a lot of great people in the district. And I hope to 
continue to build to build on that. And I also wanted to uh, say thank you on behalf of the I, I attended an award ceremony for where we got the bronze distinction from USDA today for the Healthy U.S. Challenge. And the deputy uh, director, regional director from the USDA out of the Atlanta office told me to thank you all for uh, the opportunity to come in and present that award on his behalf, the uh, Department of uh, Secretary of Agriculture, as well as President of the United States and the First Lady. Thank you. And, and now for the star of the show, literally, uh, Cynthia Tennell is the uh, cafe manager at Maxwell Elementary School. She recently appeared on the Food Network show Chopped, um, where she competed against food service, school food service professionals uh, from across the country. In addition to her outstanding cooking skills, creative flair, and superior food presentation abilities, which includes her um, sweet potato hash browns, which I think is what won it for. Um, Mrs. Tennell excelled in competition that challenged chefs to combine unusual ingredients and a palatable meal. Uh, we honor her for representing Metro Nashville Public Schools, Maxwell, and the School Nutrition Department with the distinction and being the winning chef, winning $10,000. And I have a really quick little school cafeteria worker wins big after showing off her cooking skills. Cindy Tennell won last night on the Food Network show called Chopped. Yeah, all four of the contestants from last night's episode were school chefs. We caught up with Tennell earlier yesterday at Henry Maxwell Elementary as students and staff wished her luck. First of all, I sat on my couch for probably two years watching this, watching this um, uh, program you know, specifically and going, I can never do that. So then all of a sudden I'm doing it and I'm like, what am I doing? And then as it gets ready to air, I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> uh, Tenel hopes appearing on the show is going to raise awareness about the need for healthy options for students. I have to have yeah. lunch at that school. I know. Good job. We're proud of you. That's awesome. We'll be back in just a moment. Good job. So for appearing on the Food Network series, Chop. Competing against professionals across the country, we honor you for representing Metro Nashville Public Schools School Nutrition Department and Maxwell Elementary with distinction and being the winning chef. Thank you. Congratulations, Ms. Tennell. That, that uh, Henry Maxwell is one of my schools makes it even more special. You rock. <laughs> uh, now we will have public participation. The board will hear from those persons who have requested to appear at this board meeting. In the interest of time, speakers are requested to limit remarks to three minutes or less. Comments will be timed. Uh, first up, we'll have Julie Gruss, Van Tassel, Not present. Paul Brenner. Dr. Register, board members, thank you for having me here. I've got to title that says sportsmanship, it may not sound it at the beginning, but it might at the end. This fictional story 
starts around the year 2006 when a group of affluent, persuasive people concocted a plot to change the educational system of Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools, not Metropolitan Nashville Power Structure. The plot started in the election booths of Nashville, Tennessee. Place enough money in the pockets of the right people and control the decision of the educational system. Unfortunately, in the convening years, the character of the school board changed and the scheme didn't quite come to fruition. The request was poor sportsmanship, bullying tactics, threats to influence the political agenda of the city and the state. Will all local school boards eventually be eliminated? After all, they know their schools better than anyone else. Will vouchers replace local funding and therefore local council, local politicians, local taxpayers, and local teachers? This is supposed to be a diverse American access with good schools for all hard working students. To all of you board members, don't cave in, stick to your guns, stay the course, fight back for that $3.4 million unless you can get more, and Dr. Register, when and if you talk to Great Hearts again, Please make sure that they make effective changes if we were going to do anything about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brenner. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Baldwin Tucker. I'm Dr. Carolyn Baldwin Tucker, Smithson Craighead Academy Schools Director. Appreciation is expressed to the Metropolitan Board of Public Education for allowing me to speak this evening on behalf of Smithson Craighead Academy Middle School. The middle school, which began in the fall of 2009, has been prematurely recommended for revocation of its charter by the Office of Innovation. The untimely recommendation has caused undue disruption in the school community and undue anxiety among our students and parents. I became the director of Smithson Craighead three weeks ago after Dr. Julie Williams, who was the previous director, had to resign due to illness. And I'm building on the innovations and changes which were initiated by Dr. Williams. On the 2012 state report card under academic achievement, data reported only reflected two years, 2011 and 2012, for the Smithson Craighead Middle School. It has been alleged that for three years, the school has not progressed at an acceptable rate. That is not true. The school year 2009-2010 was considered the year for baseline data, as the middle school only began in 2009. Thus, the data in the spring of 2010 is not reflected in the state's report card for academic achievement. Further, on the state report card for TVAS data, there is only one year reflected for the middle school, where two years are reflected for other schools in Metro that have been identified as priority. The Office of Innovation uh, compares Smithson Craighead with Bailey, Brick Church, and Graymar. However, those schools have three years of data for academic achievement on the state report card, and Smithson Craighead only has two years of data in that section. While we did not meet the targets set forth, we still are progressing toward those targets. We did not lose ground, but we moved steadily forward as reflected in the data. According to Title I ESEA request for waiver, priority status schools would receive additional funding from the first to the top grant in order to assist in overcoming barriers and raising test scores. Smithson Craighead Middle was denied those funds. Smithson Craighead has been given less as to perform higher and given a shorter time in which to do so. The timing of the request of the Office of Innovation preempts efforts of the school to work through those areas of difficulty. Subsequent to being identified as priority school, the following innovations and changes have occurred. 
An audit has been conducted by School Works, and findings of that audit are being addressed, and, and strategies are being implemented to enhance student learning. A data collection instrument has been developed and is being utilized by the teachers to analyze formative data resulting from the DEA assessment, comparing it to the RCPIs on the TCAP while assessing their own instruction in order to improve student learning. A mentoring program is set to begin in January 2013. Thank you, Thus, Mr. Tucker. Would you please stand? Those who are thank you, Dr. Tucker. Great kid. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Thank you. Uh, governance issues. Ms. Shepard. The consent agenda is as follows: approval of minutes of 10-19-12 regular meeting and 10-23-12 special meeting. Recommended addition to existing contract of recording studio at Pearl Cone High School, Southland Construction, LLC. Recommended award of contract for architectural services for library renovation at Wright Middle School, Hastings Architecture Associates, LLC, MBOE-12-030. Recommended award of contract for energy evaluation services for all schools, Facility Services, Inc., MBOE 12-031. Recommended award of contract for preliminary site engineering services for proposed new school site in Antioch Cluster, Barge Coffin and Associates. Change order number seven for Cambridge Elementary School, new building construction, Bomar Construction Inc. M-475. Change order number six for Cambridge Elementary School, site work, R.G. Anderson and Company Inc. M-472. Change order number two for Chadwell Elementary School additions and renovations, Southland Constructions, LLC, M-479. Change order number three for Robert Churchill Museum Magnet Elementary School renovations, Robert S. Biscayne and Company, M-418. Awarding of bids and contracts. One, APM Associates. Two, Health Master Holdings, LLC. 3. Otis Education System, Inc. 4. Tennessee State Parks. 5. University of Kansas Center for Research, Inc. 6. Christopher Johnson. 7. Metropolitan Development and, and Housing Authority. 8. Metropolitan Development and Housing Authority. 9. Crisis Prevention Institute, Inc. 10. Mid-South Bus Center, Inc. 11. Mid-South Bus Center, Inc. 12, Mid-South Bus Center, Inc., and 13, Mid-South Bus, Bus Center, Inc., 14, CDW Government, 15, Demand Mechanical, LLC. Recommended approval of Reading Textbook Adoption Committee, and L, recommended approval of Request for Compulsory Attendance Waiver. Madam Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda as read. Is there a second? Second. Uh, a vote, please. Can we get a, all those uh, in favor of the uh, motion? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Dr. Register. This is a uh, uh, recommendation uh, for, to certify charges for Monica Atkins. I'll read the charge letter. Uh, dear board members, I am writing to recommend the dismissal of Monica Atkins from employment as a tenured teacher with the Metropolitan National Public Schools pursuant to TCA 49-5-511. I have charged her with incompetence, inefficiency, neglect of duty, unprofessional conduct or conduct unbecoming to a member of the teaching profession and insubordination which are all grounds for her dismissal pursuant to TCA 49-5-511. These terms are specifically defined in TCA 49-5-501. Evidence supporting these charges was set forth in my letter to Monica Atkins on November 7, 2012, a copy of which is attached. I am asking you to certify these charges by voting that if proven true, these charges warrant Ms. Atkins' dismissal. Should you certify these charges, I will inform Ms. Atkins of your action and formally advise her of the right to request a hearing before an impartial hearing officer. At the present time, I am only asking you to certify the charges. 
I am not asking you to weigh evidence either for or against dismissal. I'm merely asking you to vote that the charges, if proven true, warrant dismissal. If Ms. Adkins requests a hearing, it will occur at some point in the future. Accordingly, it is my recommendation that Monica Atkins be dismissed from employment with the Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. Is there a motion to certify the charges? So moved. Second. 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 Um, uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Ms. Johnston? <coughs> Student dis disciplinary pill, I'm sorry. The, <clears throat> the student disciplinary uh, appeal is on your agenda number A3. The, the student through his parent and counsel had requested a hearing before this board regarding the expulsion. That's been uh, recommended and approved by the director of schools. Dr. Register, any comments? Uh, we recommend uh, upholding the uh, discipline action as taken. Is there a motion? I move to affirm this decision. A second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. The motion and, passes. And you need to uh, agree to uh, deny or grant that hearing, which is the actual request from the parent. Move to deny the hearing. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor of denying the hearing of the uh, motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Johnston. Uh, Dr. Register, recommended approval of MNPS commitment to diversity resolution. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'll, I'll appreciate the opportunity to make a few brief comments about this. I'm, I must say that I'm tempted to read the resolution. Uh, but we'll defer to a board member if someone wishes to read that. Um, I want to say that uh, this conversation started uh, almost a year ago uh, when uh, the Board of Education, not quite a year ago, but in the, in the winter of last year, uh, when uh, we started some discussions about a commitment to diversity in our school system, uh, when we were uh, basically still in, in federal court over the desegregation case. Uh, and um, we uh, engaged uh, during that court case the services of Dr. Leonard Stevens as an expert witness who brings a wealth of knowledge <coughs> over many decades of work in desegregation in this country. And uh, we had, uh, uh, during the course of the next few months, we had uh, discussions with the board. We had a discussion in a retreat. We've had work sessions on this. Uh, and uh, the Board of Education, for the, for the viewers, has uh, discussed at length this commitment that is proposed in the form of a, regu a re resolution tonight. Uh, I, think, I think the things I want to say about it at this point in time are that it really does, and I'll use Dr. Stevens' word, words here, it really does move us from an era of desegregation uh, to uh, because we're now a unitary system and we've we've, uh, we've been designated as that for some period of time and and we've uh, 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 moved on past that uh, to an era of managing diversity and I think that's very important in a district like ours in one that is so diverse as Metropolitan <coughs> Nashville Public Schools. Uh, I'll say this: all, all of the board members recognize this, but there's not a majority race in Davidson County in Davidson County Schools. Uh, we have, we have uh, all races represented in our school system. Our children speak 135 different languages and come from 108 different countries in our school system. And we're growing more diverse as time goes on. Uh, and uh, we need to recognize that as an opportunity and an advantage for uh, us to serve the children that we represent who are, who are very diverse uh, community. Um, so uh, managing diversity means that we are unitary. We, we, we have been declared one system that is not segregated. Uh, we're not under court supervision at this time. We are not subject to quotas 
to closing schools, to forced busing. We are not subject to that. But it is very important that we're very intentional about the decisions that we make going forward in the school system, that we make good decisions that promote healthy, diverse schools in our, across our district as a whole, and that do not move in, in different directions. Uh, this commitment is a first step. Uh, it is a leadership commitment. It is a commitment of this Board of Education and this administration to promoting that, to managing effectively uh, our diverse school system as we move forward. And next steps will be that we share this uh, across the community, that we engage the community in conversations, and that we look at all of our policies, our practices, our procedures as we go forward to make sure that they are consistent with this commitment to diversity. Uh, and so we present this to you tonight in form of a resolution. It's, it, they are your words. Uh, they're words that you've worked on, and we've put it in a, uh, a resolution format for you, but very few changes to this commitment, uh, in, in just, just editing. Uh, and we propose this to you uh, for consideration, and then we'll take the next steps to take a close examination of all of the policies that affect uh, decision-making in our school system and decisions that are made uh, as we go forward. Madam Chair. Uh, if no one else wants to read the resolution, I'll take it on. Okay, great. <laughs> resolution, the Metro Nashville Davidson County Board of Public Education, Nashville, Tennessee. The Metro Nashville Board of Public Education, through the unanimous voice of its nine member, of its nine elected members, supports the motion that Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools reaffirms its commitment to embrace and value a diverse student population and community as noted in the school district's vision statement by declaring and adhering to principles regarding diversity in our schools. Whereas value is added to the quality of education when students learn in settings that are diverse by race, ethnicity, culture, and income level, because our vision statement says all students bring unique cultural backgrounds, learning styles, abilities, and interests to the schools. Whereas all students should be provided the benefits of learning in diverse settings because our vision statement declares different perspectives and backgrounds form the cornerstone of our strong public education system. Whereas quality, diverse schools at all grade levels are indispensable to the civic and educational purpose of this school district because in the words of the Supreme Court of the United States, education is the very foundation of good citizenship. Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. <coughs> And whereas our schools should preserve support and, fur and further diversity in education by being planned and operated in a manner that maximizes diversity and minimizes isolation, both in a school as a whole and in its classes and programs. Be it therefore resolved that the Metro Nashville Board of Education issues this resolution in support of the reaffirmation of the commitment to embracing and valuing a diverse student population and community. Through this resolution, the board directs the director of schools to develop and prom <laughs> prom I'm going to get this in a second. Promulgate, prom I cannot say that word. Promulgate. Promulgate appropriate regulations, instructions, plans, and programs to establish a definition of an integrated school which is meaningful, practical, and embraces measures of diversity, including but not limited to race and ethnicity develop and manage a comprehensive district-wide diversity strategy oriented to maximize the number of schools that meet the district's definition of diversity and to meet the needs of students in schools that do not meet the definition. Manage district functions to preserve, support, and further diversity in the, and, and further diversity in the schools. Enhance diversity by hiring diverse school and central office personnel and ensure that charter schools in the district have and use diversity plans that meet the same diversity stand standards expected of all metro <coughs> schools and ensure that the district's diversity standards and readily available are readily available to operating charter schools and <coughs> charter applicants. In furtherance of the above directives, the board requests that the director of schools keep the board informed on the development and operation of the definition and integrated school and the district-wide diversity strategy Keep the board informed on the status at, of prognosis for diversity in the schools by providing periodic briefings and reports, and as necessary, to bring to the board recommendations for board action to further diversity <coughs> in the schools. 
keep staff of the district certified and non-certified as well as parent and public constituencies with interest in the district informed on this board commitment and the district plans and activities to carry it out. Cause data and information to be collected, analyzed, and reported which will illuminate the status of diversity in the schools and the trend of diversity system-wide. And make use of the district student assignment task force as a community-based vehicle to help monitor, monitor diversity in the schools. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, this is great. Um, any discussion from school board members? Mr. Pinkston? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've just got a couple of questions about the process, uh, and I've gotten questions from members of the Metro Council as well as some <coughs> constituents of mine. And so uh, just in the interest of managing expectations, I think what we're saying is, and Dr. Register, correct me if I'm wrong, the document before us is a basic value statement that, that has been discussed and now is being formally articulated by the board. But at the end of the day, we're still going to work toward the checklist concept that we previously discussed. In other words, the checklist that's going to lay out the six or eight or ten practical steps that can be undertaken by the district and charter operators to promote diversity in schools of choice. And um, in my mind, I think this framing is exactly the right framing. But the, the key deliverable, and it sounds like that's going to take a little bit longer to produce, is that list of the practical things that we're going to do as a school system and ask that others do as well. So um, I'm just. Uh, uh, remind anybody who's following along that this has been promised. Uh, Dr. Register has assured us it's going to be done in a way that's collaborative, that solicits input from the community in a structured way, whether that's focus groups or written comment or other means that allows this work to proceed. And, and am I kind of getting all that correct? That's correct. We we uh, we have to do the great majority of this work by January 1st, between now and January 1st. I'm not sure that we can get it done. Actually, we were. Uh, sidetracked a little bit with when the hurricane hit New York because we had our national advisory panel coming in and we were going to have a, a session on how how we move forward with this. Uh, uh, Dr. Stevens and, um, uh, and and some others were going to help us with this, but we're reviewing the policies and practices procedures of the district. That will that will be a part of the development of this program as we go forward and to identify that checklist, if you will, uh, a monitoring device for the Board of Education to use as we go forward. Uh, I think we're, uh, well, at this point in time, we need to, w once we get board approval, we can move ahead with, with good speed on this, using Dr. Stevens as our primary, uh, uh, primary consultant in this work. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All uh, in favor of the approval of the um, commitment to diversity resolutions, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. It's a great approval. I've got to say that. <laughs> it's a great direction for us in the school system, the leadership position for our school system in the country. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda, a recommendation to authorize Dr. Register to enter into discussions with Great Hearts Academies uh, about future application. Ms. Shepard. Madam Chair, Dr. Register, and my colleagues on the board, I'll, I'll be sh uh, brief and succinct in my remarks. Um, as I indicated at the last uh, work session, I would bring this motion before the board tonight uh, as a formal motion. Um, so I so move that the Metropolitan National Board of um, Education give the authority and support to Dr. Register to reach out to great, the Great Hearts organization for the purpose of providing guidance and pertinent information for any future political school application, uh, future potential charter school applications from Great Hearts. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, is there a second? <laughs> We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Mr. Hayes. Um, maybe this is a point of clarification. Um, is Dr. Redshirt not currently within his job duty authorized to have discussions with potential school leaders? Is he not permitted to have those conversations? I believe he is, but if I'm correct, because we don't actually have an active application for Great Hearts, then we want to provide him that opportunity outside of his normal duties. Am I correct in that, Dr. Register? Yeah, we, I, could, I could do that without 
your approval, but I think since the board, my response to you is that since the board denied that application before, I think it's very appropriate for there to be a motion to authorize or uh, authorize me to do so. And, and, uh, you, but for any future charter applicant, you would have the ability and your job duty to talk to any potential school leader, correct? And, and I guess where I'm coming from is, is authorize or should it be require? You know, we would, we would like you to go and have a conversation versus you're authorized because I think you already have the authorization to talk to whoever you want. And, and I, I think the intent, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, uh, Ms. Shepard, is you, you'd like for him to have a conversation with because the authority exists today. So I, I'm just trying to understand your role and authority and, and then the motion because I believe the authority exists and I think your motion is we'd like for you to go and have a conversation with. Is that accurate? Because it's not, you, your motion is to authorize him to have, do something he already has the power to do. I'm not sure that that's in his realm of responsibilities at this point in time. You're not sure that he has the authority to have a conversation with them today? I'm not sure that reaching out to a potential charter school applicant mm -hmm. is within his realm of responsibility at this time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Dr. Brown. I think it would be more like recruiting. And in light without of... Without the board's fact, approval. Right, without the board's approval. And in light of the denial, uh, I think that it's well within... Uh, our our position to request that you do that. Right, and that's, that, that was, I guess, the, the, the point that I'm seeking <coughs> clarification on is authorization a request. Madam Are we Chair, asking him or just giving him authority? May I make a friendly amendment to the motion? Yes, ma'am. That we amend the motion to say that we would request Dr. Register to enter in discussion with Great Hearts, Ms. Shepard, if you don't mind. I don't mind. There's been an amendment to the motion. Is there a second on the amendment? Second. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Discussion? Um, my understanding of these discussions are that we are simply having a discussion of how Great Hearts might fit into our mission should Great Hearts decide to reapply. That is correct. And it is not to change our vote. Absolutely not. Um, and so, you know, I'm in favor of talking to any school about how they might fit into our mission, particularly since we're having these diversity conversations. I am fine with that. Um, my only concern is that this does not become a backdoor way for Great Hearts to slip in without um, complying with the diversity requirements set by the state uh, or without having a pending application. Because if that's what happens, then we will have wasted the last few months of no, our lives. The, the, so, the motion yeah. is to uh, provide them, it, should they decide to present an application during the regular application session, right. they have that opportunity to do so. Um, it, we need to be very clear in saying that this does not open the door for Great Hearts to reapply now outside of the application period. Uh, this does not automatically approve any application. This is our way of going to them and providing them an opportunity. If in the future they decide to present an application, then it's going to be a smart way for them to present that application to us for approval, as opposed to um, the few months that we've just experienced. So it is not in any, it should not be uh, mis misconceived or misunderstood as Great Hearts being able to come back in and get an approval. It is, Great Hearts does not have an active application um, with the Office of Innovation. And, and I think we've made it clear, you know, with our, in our conversations with the state and otherwise that, you know, Great Hearts as, you know, is welcome to reapply in the spring. Absolutely. That process starts in January. Um, and so, you know, that can be part of the discussion. Um, um, but I, I guess that's my concern is that we, this is just a discussion, it's a continuation of the negotiations with the state um, and in the hopes of retaining the $3.4 million as well as clarifying our position with this particular school. And again, we, we need to be very clear that it is not an approval, it is not seeking an approval for Great Hearts. It is uh, providing our director of schools an opportunity to have a discussion with the Great Hearts organization on how they, if they wanted to present an application for consideration in Metro Nashville Public Schools. This is what we're looking for. These are our guidelines and requirements, and this is what you will be expected to follow. 
And, and the last thing I want to say is I'm fine with this. I'm fine having this discussion. Um, the only thing that I think we need to make a decision about what we're going to do with this, you know, after this point, because we've been in negotiations for months now, and you know, I think we are we don't want to set ourselves up to continue this on forever. So I would like to um, set a time where we're either going to vote to litigate or vote to move forward and be done, uh, maybe at the next meeting, and that's something you know, we can take up in discussion. Well, uh, if you want to bring a motion at the next regular business meeting, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, okay. Just kind of give us an idea of what that motion might be. Um, well, I suppose it will depend on what, <laughs> how the conversations go with Great Hearts. Um, uh, but what I would like to, to do at the next meeting is that we vote either to litigate or to drop drop the negotiations and move forward. So are you saying you're going to bring a motion? Yes, it would be the next meeting. So the next meeting would the be next, in uh, two. regular business meeting. OK. Not the next December. work session, but so that's December. a month. Second Tuesday December, December 11th. December. OK. Um, but and then we're already we're working against a deadline anyway on the, the, um, the statute of limitations, which is mid-December. So we would have to probably have that discussion okay. anyway. If you will submit your motion uh, to Ms. Hawkins, and we'll uh, get it added to the agenda for our next regular business meeting. OK. Uh, for the motion that's currently on the table, any other discussion? Mr. Hayes. Do we have, uh, to the extent that we are um, in the amended motion requesting, is that right, that Dr. Is Gentry? Correct. That is yeah. uh, Do we have an expected uh, report or timeline back? Does anybody think we'll hear something back in 30 days? Are we talking about? Uh, Dr. Register, do you have well, an expectation? Well, so Ms. Shepard uh, and I had uh, had a conversation about her proposed recommendation, and, and it would be my intention to reach out immediately to talk about what went wrong before, to talk about mistakes that were made uh, in the process, uh, and to clarify any positions that we have, but to do uh, a good faith effort to say, here's, here's, here's the process that works in Nashville, and, and uh, here's, here's, uh, a, a, it's a good conversation about how to how to move forward with this. Uh, you're later tonight. You've got a, a report on the charter school application process. Uh, Mr. Coverstone's been working on this, and we've uh, we think we've uh, tightened up and clarified the application process. And and we are working on. Uh, you've just approved a commitment to diversity that I think has an impact on this. So it's an opportunity for us to. Uh, reach out to a charter school provider that was denied, that, that you rejected, uh, and to say here's, uh, here's, here's uh, feedback on that process and how we're uh, moving ahead with this and, and should you decide to uh, submit an application in the future, here's some suggestions and here, here, are, uh, 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 here are our ideas and what our expectations are moving forward. And we need to keep in one thing in mind. Um, this is a good faith effort. It's not um, to be automatically assumed that Great Hearts is even still interested in Metro Nashville Public Schools. But the one thing that should they be interested in coming back to the table, then they understand, as I said before, what the process is. They understand what it will take to open a charter school in at Metro Nashville Public Schools District. So I think that is what the, the gist of this motion, or now the amended motion, um, is. Um, but again, we have to keep in mind that the interest may not even be there. Absolutely. So um, Dr. Register, if uh, you can offer a report at our next regular business meeting, mm -hmm. I, would, I would definitely appreciate that. Sure. Uh, now we're back to the amended motion. It's been, uh, the motion's been made and seconded. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of the amended motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. That also indicates that the uh, main motion would fail because the second motion passes. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Great discussion. Uh, next on the agenda, recommendation to retain independent counsel for the um, Board of Education. Ms. Brogue? Um, I move that we begin the process of um, considering and hiring independent counsel for our board um, to use moving forward. Is there a second? Do you mean to go ahead? Yes, go ahead and finish your motion. I'm yeah, sorry. that's my motion. I have discussion okay. after. Is there a second? Second. Uh, discussion? 
Um, and I just want to clarify why I've raised this. Um, just, to, just to clarify to my fellow board members, um, I raised the issue of conflict, and I want to sort of explain what that means, um, just so we have no questions. Um, you know, to raise the issue of conflict with attorneys is not to question um, the attorney's ethics or uh, expertise or ability to represent clients. It is merely to um, to raise the, the issue of whether the attorney is representing uh, more than one interest that might be conflicting and that might impede the lawyer's ability to provide uh, the most zealous representation for one client. Um, and so I've already sort of made comments about what's happened in this particular case. Um, you know, this is nothing personal against our lawyers. I think we do have well-qualified lawyers um, and good lawyers. Um, but uh, you know, I think we have been working with a group of attorneys, first Metro Legal, um, and they have traditionally represented us, but in this particular case, I think everyone pretty much agrees at this point that they were conflicted on this case. And then most recently, we've been working with um, Mr. Cagle, um, and I still have some questions about whether um, he might be conflicted in this particular case. Um, and then the other sort of issue is that he has been working alongside Metro Legal this entire time um, and now has sort of just stepped away. So I just have some questions about how this has sort of been handled and it seems a little messy to me. It's made me a little uncomfortable. And so I want to prevent this in the future. Um, and so I would like for us to start a process and I'm open to discussion as how to do that if we want to um, you know, open up the floor to have uh, people apply. Um, if we have suggestions. And I also want to make it really clear that I am not looking for someone who I know personally um, or who, who I think might agree with my position. I just want, it, want to make sure that we're not in a position where there is any question in the future. And also, you know, we want to avoid the appearance of impropriety um, for the board. And we also want to be in a position as a board where we feel very comfortable, you know, that we are, we are completely independent of other, any other entity that might be involved in our discussions. Any other discussion? I have uh, Mr. Pinkston. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to revisiting uh, how we approach legal, but I do think we need to be careful about it and study what, if any, obstacles we encounter along the way. Um, I've heard from a couple of former members of this board that this has been explored in the past and that there may be some uh, obstacles within the Metro Charter that we need to look at, maybe look at state law um, uh, along the way as well and see how those two things reconcile. Um, I've got budget questions, including you know, how much in resources do we currently commit to legal representation? What would we be looking at if we uh, changed horses from a procurement perspective? What does the process look like for relocating representation? Does that involve an RFP? How do we structure that when it comes to waiting experience versus cost and other <laughs> considerations? Um, Ms. Fro brought up the, the issue of conflict or potential for conflict on any given issue. I, I think in an area of law that's highly specialized, even though Tennessee doesn't technically allow legal specialties. Uh, this, this one is uh, for all practical matters. I've got some concern about whether we'd be able to find someone who truly has no potential for conflict unless, of course, they're an employee of ours. And, and then I think we need to look at how this affects ongoing litigation, especially Spurlock. Um, so I, again, I'm not knee-jerk opposed to exploring it, but, but definitely would like to move very, very carefully before making a decision. I'm wondering, uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, if this might be a work session topic for the future, just to understand from a 360 view, kind of what we're talking about here. Thank you. And I have um, a question for clarity. Um, in your motion, are you suggesting, or are you making a motion for counsel for overall all business of the Board of Education or based on particular issues? Um, you know, I think, it, I mean, I think Mr. Pinkson has raised some valid issues. We're going to have different needs for different issues. Um, but I think we need to be proactive about how we deal with the attorneys that we are hiring. Um, you know, and it, there it may be a situation where we do use Metro Legal for some issues like torts litigation or that type of thing. Um, but I just think we need to have a discussion. Any further discussion from board members? Dr. Register, any uh, discussion? Well, uh, they, uh, I, have, I have worked in the past where <coughs> The boards had different representation from uh, administration, and a lot of our um, a lot of our work is HR work and uh, the tort the torts and the things that you're mentioning there. And and I would think uh, 
and my personal recommendation would be to stay with uh, Metro Legal to do a lot of that detail work that we have going on and that's a great preponderance of what we have uh, in to uh, so as a part of the discussion uh, I would suggest that we perhaps separate uh, legal representation between administration and the board. Any further discussion? Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. aye. Motion fails. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, we have a recommendation to revoke Smith and Craighead Middle School Charter, effective May, 20, May 24, 2013. Dr. Register. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm going to re read a resolution as my recommendation to the board. Be it resolved that the Metropolitan National Board of Public Education revoke the charter of Smith and Craighead Middle School in accordance with TCA. 49-13-122, effective as of the last day of school, May 24, 2012, based upon the school's designation by the Tennessee Department of Education as a priority school in the bottom 5% of schools statewide, and the data in the Office of Innovation presentation uh, of November 12, 2012, regarding the school's three-year performance. Whereas priority status is calculated by the Tennessee Department of Education and included as a basis for revocation of charters without appeal in TCA 49-13-122 and whereas MNPS charter school closure procedures state a charter school in the bottom 5% of the state's academic accountability system and labeled as a priority school will be closed and whereas the individual data charts in the Smithson Craighead Middle School Overview of Student Performance 2010 through 2012 show plainly that the school underperforms the district average, the averages of other charter schools serving similar populations and other district-run schools serving similar student populations. Therefore, the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Public Education authorizes the Office of Innovation to impose such conditions on the school and its Board of Trustees in accordance with TCA 49-13-122 as is determined to be necessary to enable the school to complete the current school year and then terminate its operations. In connection with determining and imposing such conditions on the school, the Office of Innovation may confer with a transition committee that shall be established in consultation with the parents of students at Smith and Craighead Middle School and community leaders. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, it's my recommendation that you approve this resolution. Yes. Mr. Coverstein will be glad to answer any specifics of the process. Is there a motion for uh, revocation of the uh, Smith and Craighead Charter? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. May I ask a question, Mr. Coverstone? Yes. Um, Alan, thank you for all the work that you've done on this. I, I have a question about what would it take for Smithson Craighead to come off the priority list at the end of this school year? What kind of results would we need? The priority designation is a three-year designation. It's only redone once every three years. And that three-year designation, the third year, the year that they needed to come up in order to come off priority status was 2011-2012. It's that three-year bucket of data that got them classified as a priority school. And with due respect to Dr. Tucker, I confirmed again this morning on the phone with Aaron O'Hara at the state that three years of data in all three subjects were used to calculate priority status for Smith and Craighead Middle School and that it is the lowest performing by that measure in Nashville. Ms. Shepard? Mr. Coverstone, um, in the case that they were uh, allowed to remain open, 
because they have the designation from the state as a priority school, what would likely happen at the end of this coming school year? Uh, happen in terms of? Of, of, the, of their status. The, they, they retain the status for three years based on the previous three years, and the state doesn't rerun the calculations for priority status for another three years. So they would retain that priority status. The, the point of this is that notice about improvement has been present every single year. The first year's performance was low, they restructured for turnaround. The second year's performance was low, they restructured for turnaround. The third year's performance was low and they were identified in the bottom 5%. That data was made public November 1st. The priority list was announced in August. And on November 1st, as of November 1st, we have the data that you have in the packets in order to show you the work that they compiled over those three years. Our recommendation is to act definitively now so that parents can take advantage of the choice window that's open for magnet schools, other charter schools, open enrollment schools before those waiting lists are closed and therefore they can transition more effectively at the end of the year. Uh, there's a major disruption that's caused when a school performs this way. It's caused by the school and our effort is to minimize that disruption by acting now, working with parents to communicate their choices and then help them to make that transition during the summer. And we're speaking of just the middle school. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Any further discussion? Ms. Baring uh, and then Dr. Brannon. Yes. Uh, my concern is that we have six months left in the school year. And um, although parents have a lot of choices that they can make where they want to send their children, uh, it's difficult to move your child in the middle of the year. And uh, I'd like to consider the implications of, of putting the school on probation uh, with the knowledge that if they don't make a certain amount of achievement by you know, May the 24th, that then they will close at that time. So it wouldn't change anything in terms of you know, closing on May 24th, but I think there would be a lot more impetus to do well these next six months as to be in a situation where, you know, this, it, you don't, you're not really motivated to do that. This is the way that the charter school deal works because if we wait until the end of the year, we are closing out and denying the opportunity for families to be part of other magnet schools or charter schools who will fill and who will c accumulate their wait lists in January of this year. So we have to take this action now. The reason we're doing this now in the regular cycle is because we gave the full three years everything that they were entitled to in terms of the amount of achievement that they could compile and we waited until that data was released. We priority status and our recommendation are based on that three year body of work. And so we have come to the end of that school year and we are doing our best to provide a stable school year and a manageable transition to other optional schools that just won't be available if we wait until May. Dr. Brennan? Yes, I have two questions. What would prevent parents from applying uh, to their choice schools uh, at this point um, and using the probationary period until May. Uh, that, is there anything that will prevent a parent from applying for choice at this point? Yeah, that's a really unreasonable burden to put on the families, frankly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. If they apply, they will have to accept or decline those seats when the lists are compiled in January, meaning that they, at that point, will either have to decide to leave the school or decide to chance it out on the hope that it will improve sufficiently. And by the way, we haven't even set a standard for what we're looking for in terms of improvement. This is very clearly tied to the priority school status and the three-year body of work that was compiled in the previous three years. This is the action that was earned then, not going forward. So we, we just don't think families should have to make that sort of gamble. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a public meeting. This is a meeting that is held in the public. Please refrain from making remarks. Thank you.
Dr. Brennan. Uh, my other question has to do with the elementary school and the kinds of help that was provided for them as they were struggling uh, uh, initially. So um, I was interested in knowing what kind of help has been provided to Smithson Cricket. We didn't give any additional assistance that's not been provided here. The elementary school took seriously its status and in the year prior to the recommendation for closure used much greater attention to data-driven instruction, worked with its teachers, worked in teams, and worked with its students, and achieved what it promised in its contractual obligations with us through its work. And it was commended for that, and it escaped that recommendation of closure. That time was last year, and that notice has been evident and apparent, and the school at the middle school has been unable to achieve the same results, despite some strong people being involved. One other question. Uh, can you indicate how it happened that they did not get the funding that other schools in this same uh, situation were? Uh, that funding is awarded through the state. I believe they approached the state. And it is the state's opinion that charter schools in the bottom 5% ought also to be closed. Uh, and that, Mr. Coverstone, I have a, a question, and it kind of goes back to what Ms. Spearing and Dr. Brannon uh, sort of put on the table regarding probation and open enrollment. I know that uh, we are in the middle of the open enrollment or choice period, um, and you stated that um, you, it's, it's an unfair burden to put on parents if we wait until the end of the school year to make a decision if probation is granted. Um, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this question to you. So if probation is granted to the school and with the understanding of the parents that have children enrolled in the school, that uh, this is your only opportunity to uh, apply for choice schools, other magnets or other charter schools during the month of November. If this school does not improve at the end of the school year, based on the stipulations of probation, the school will be closed and you will have no choice but to send your children back to what I'm assuming are the zone schools. Um, is, is, that, does that, is that a possibility, is I guess my question, um, with well, the parents' full knowledge? With, with all due respect, mm -hmm. this is action that is based on the results through 2012. Mm -hmm. This is the time to take that action. Mm -hmm. The time for improvement is past. Right. And, yeah. So with that in mind, and that I think is my obligation to mm -hmm. recommend to you based on that status that you act decisively on that, I also do not believe, and if I put myself in that parent's shoes, mm -hmm. that I would effectively know how to navigate the position of gambling on another year when I have a choice in front of me, which either means major disruptions in the school in terms of composition, predictability, and budgeting for the next year, certainly to include staffing and other decisions, or it means that the school uh, will be uh, you know, leaving parents in a lurch at the end of the year. Okay, and another question um, regarding um, not or, or offering pro probation, and this is just a scenario situation. Um, if the school is granted probation and they fail, um, the likelihood of students being reassigned back to their zone schools is probable. At that point, am I correct in that if the students re-enter their zone school, there has to be some sort of testing to determine where they will be placed in that school? No, or charter are schools are fully district down? schools. That would be okay. true from certain categories okay. of private schools, but not, not most, and not those that are accredited by the state of Tennessee okay. and not by charter schools. They would be accredited grade-wise. And uh, I'm sorry. If, I'm, if I may, um, uh, uh, we, uh, Mr. Coverstone and I talked about the timing on this, and of course the, the primary uh, motivation for doing this now is that the state reports out, so, mm -hmm. so the data's out. But, but let me, let me go back and, and talk to you just a little bit about the process that we use for uh, filling a great many choice applications in our school district. And that, that process has changed. I think this speaks to Dr. Brown's issue too. Everyone in the district, every parent in the district who wants to make a choice other than a zone school has, has to make that 
has to declare that now, has to apply. Parents have an, an opportunity to make two or three choices, three choices or more really, and, and they can be given their first, first, uh, uh, first choice and they'll be notified of that early. Uh, there is a, it's a different timeline, but the, charter, the other charter schools in the district also have an application process with, and, and many of these uh, uh, choice options that are available to parents will fill up. If parents don't select that choice, then the option's gone. It's not held. It can't, it, it, and the process is much tighter now. It's much more controlled. They have an opportunity now to apply in January, I believe. I'm not sure what the date is. January or February, they have to say yes or no. I want my first choice. Uh, if they don't get their first choice, they have an option for their second choice and then their third choice. The charter school application process is the same. Um, about one in four of our children choose, almost one in four choose choice options. And what would effectively happen if we uh, don't uh, uh, Make this uh, make this outreach to parents now to have them make choices is that those choices will be closed out to the students, and that that's the reason for doing this at this point in time. It's time now to be planning for next year. Okay, and and I just want for clarification, I'm looking at these um, the academic scores, uh, the student achievement and, and academic gains, uh, 2010 to 2012. I'm looking just at uh, the 2012 alone. And I'm looking at the math. We have, you know, um, this one. How? No, I'm, the one that I'm looking at says Smithson Craighead Middle School compared to other schools, student achievement and academic gains. That one. These. Mm -mm. No, keep going. That one. And yeah, and I'm looking at the the the, the averages. Um, Smith and Craighead Middle versus the MNPS district average and other charters average. And it is astounding the percentage points that uh, differ here. Um, I'm looking at this from 2010 to 2012 in all three categories. And there is, in, in 2012 alone, and, and correct me if I'm misreading this, but there is a 30% gap in math, a 27% gap in reading language, and a 34% gap in science between basically the, the MNPS district average and uh, Smiths and Craighead. Am I reading this correctly? Yes, you are. And this, these are the most recent scores. The 2012 are the most, recent re most recently released scores. Correct, and this chart includes all three years' scores. I might also point out that um, you know the third by the third year, three out of the four grades in the school were filled with students who entered that school after it was created, which gives maximum opportunity to create the culture, to create the program, to create the direction that they want. They've had maximum control over that, and approximately 40 percent of the students in this school came through the elementary school that they also operate. They've had the maximum opportunity to be successful in these three years, and that's why we feel so strongly about following through on the contract agreement that we have. Thank you. Any further discussion? Mr. Hayes and then Ms. Froke. Uh, to the extent that um, uh, a motion comes for probation versus termination or, or uh, uh, termination of the charter agreement, uh, is the the timeline uh, for receipt of data by which we'd actually know how well they did? I, I thought it was well it would be well into. It would be. It would be the same timeline we're looking at right now. That data would come out, and in the fall we would have to act. We we would not have that data at the end of May. There's no measurable objective that we would have May 24th or July 1st even. No, sir. That's why the timeline is as it is. To the extent that, that we have compared, uh, well, your office has compared um, this school uh, to other NPS schools, uh, zone schools, or Dr. Tucker specifically referenced, uh, Bailey, Brick Church, Graymore, schools that are in the bottom 5%. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's happening with those other schools, the bottom 5%? Certainly. All of those schools um, 
have new principles, new leadership, new direction, and um, you know, completely top to bottom have been changed. They are all assuming ambitious gains of 10% or more in reading and math each year, and they are um, committing to moving 100% of their teachers to uh, ratings of three, effective or above, on the team evaluation and composite scores this year. So a, a year ago when uh when this data began to come out and they were placed on priority status, did Smith and Craighead Middle go through the same exercise to find a highly effective school leader to, to train or retrain or recruit exceptional educators to, to double down and recommit? Did, you, did your office see that? Well, again, there have been four principals and five school leaders in the three years, each year and sometimes during the year they have made those kinds of efforts, but the results have remained flat. Ms. Frog? Mr. Hayes covered my question. Any other discussion? Mr. Pinkston and then Ms. Kim. Um, if this were to go forward, um, the way this is being requested, you know, changing schools is a traumatic event for any family, much less doing it under these circumstances. I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, what support services we would provide uh, in order to make this as smooth a transition as possible. If, if this were to go forward. Right. Yes, yesterday we um, you know, met with Sister Sandra and Dr. Tucker and, and uh, m let them know that we would be aggressively reaching out to connect with the parents, to assist them, to provide a description, a full description of all of the choices that are available and assist them in applying for those choices, uh, giving them the support that they need in order to apply. Uh, whether that, will, that meeting would be held at their school or whether it be held on another site near the school is up to Sister Sandra and Dr. Tucker in terms of how they'd like us to uh, approach that. But under any circumstances, by early next week, we'll have a parents meeting where individual parents are able to complete the applications and we will go to lengths to make sure that we communicate individually with those who aren't there. Ms. Frog and then Mr. Hayes. I'm sorry, Ms. Kim and then Mr. Hayes. Oh, just to build a little bit on a, a previous thought and question, what is, the, what is the broader policy that's going to in decision making around uh, low achieving schools? I think that's sort of what Mr. Hayes was getting at, but what's that sort of long term? Because I. I right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, at the present time, uh, we are moving cautiously but aggressively in trying to deal with the bottom 5% first. That's the clearest cut designation in the new AYP waiver. However, the AYP waiver does ask districts to establish accountability frameworks. We have spent the last year working with the National Association of Charter School Authorizers to establish a balanced set of measures, including student achievement, growth, college readiness, and the like that can be used to raise the bar even further than that bottom 5%. At the end of the day, we need to raise the performance of all of our schools and all of our charter schools, and our commitment has been to develop a balanced framework that can be applied and guide decisions that will drive those schools forward accountability-wise. Okay. Um, and to follow up on that, that sounds um, smart. Uh, is that transparent? Yeah, it's not in place yet. Um, that's why we're moving cautiously with just the 5%. We don't have the grounds for those that are maybe the 10th percent or the 15th percent, which also need to go forward. But we would like to bring that forward as quickly as possible. We have every intention of uh, having that vetted and, and in place for the next round of charter contracts, as well as other schools and accountability. We, we need to do that as quickly as we can. Mr. Hayes? Thank you. And then Dr. Brennan? Um, to the extent um, we have a discussion this evening or, or a motion carries to, to close the school. Uh, from a practical standpoint, I, I think a little bit back about um, uh, how global unwound uh, and how we were stuck with a bill and a, a big a big bill 
Um, and I think back about the students and the, the families in particular who've made a choice to attend the school, uh, as well as, frankly, the staff that the, the school has hired who have a, um, who have a job uh, and, and certainly have real concerns for, for all parties uh, with, the, with the, you know, the weight uh, of the, the vote that really sits before us this evening. Um, and if the motion carries tonight uh, to close, um, I, you know, I, I would wonder uh, charter schools have a, have a fixed, fixed operating cost in, in facilities and, and other things, you know, facilities, utilities, staff. As we, if this motion carries this evening, uh, I wonder, do, do students, for example, take the opportunity to transfer out mid-year? And, and I guess the, this, this question or, or point of discussion revolves around uh, the economic impact to the school itself and the staff. I think second, our ability, if parents elected to make a choice and transfer to a zone school mid-year, because you know, they, they see these academic results. They see how poorly Smith and Craig had this done. They say, you know what, we're ready to pull our kid out now. They can get on a bus. They can go to a different school January 1st. We know that there's a high mobility rate within the, within the county already. Um, as the school, let's say the school does unwind and loses 20% of its student population and funding in the next two months, and I, I'm just uh, it's theorizing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering um, how in closing a school do we deal with making sure that they meet the obligations during the last four or five months within the charter to educate children, right, within um, state and, and local guidelines, laws. I, I, I've got to think that the, the, if the motion carries, the economic consequences are really going to be difficult, right? They could lose a teacher and have an inability to recruit a new teacher out. Class sizes could jump. They could lose, and there, there are a lot of things that, um, concern me about a vote mid-year, and I'm wondering how much you've, you've thought about those ramifications. And then the second piece is, uh, to that question is, is there much you think that we could do uh, to use this um, unfortunate situation, if it, if it happens, to implore the state to give us more timely access to data? This is, a, you know, in my opinion, at least this is a much better decision made in, in June, uh, you know, June 30th. Uh, I get that students and families would miss the, miss the choice, um, but, but the unwinding of a school and the vote to do that mid-year, uh, I've got to think is a challenge. So I'm wondering how much you've thought about that, how much our zone schools have capacity to take kids now, uh, as well as in the spring. Um, and then could you talk a little bit about state and data and, and reporting. Yeah, I mean, it, yes, we should have the data earlier just to take that. I mean, the earlier the better. These decisions need to be made and it's not just charter school decisions. The June 30th to August 1st time because of the choice window still presents the same dilemma. And, um, you know, we, we work closely with NAXA and debate very aggressively among the best authorizers in the country what is the better way to approach this. Uh, I want to be clear that our intention is for the school to finish strong, that any efforts that are underway right now be continued, that the commitment to the school that the families feel will continue, and we have no reason to believe that en masse that would change. I mean, you see the commitment here tonight. We are not encouraging families to leave mid-year, though families always have their choices, and we are sensitive to what that means for the zone schools in terms of their resources and have talked to principals about that possibility. We also have a detailed roadmap of the many things that you mentioned in terms in terms of benefits and jobs and communicating with employees, et cetera, that the school will need tremendous support with. And that is mapped out for the purpose of trying to make sure that we provide as much support and as much resource as possible. 
Um, we also have access to uh, some funds from our PMRC grant, which will enable us to hire a, uh, a person part-time to assist to make sure that, you know, Carol and I don't drop the ball on something and that they have the attention that they need, that we're working within the offices here that intersect with the school. And in terms of the global uh, denouement, the uh, the situation was different in a number of ways, and we have corrected uh, the large-scale uh, structural challenges that put the financial situation in the state that it was in. Now, that is not to say that if there is a mass exodus that those changes will not exert pressure on the school as they go through the remainder of the year, and we'll have to negotiate and support them in that. And, and, I, and it may not even be a mass exodus of people choosing to leave. Uh, but but normal mobility, right, that we see across the district, and, and I'm assuming that, that maybe as a charter there, mobility rate might be lower than a, than a zone school because parents have chosen to go there and may make every effort to have their kid there. But, but if, if just through normal mobility they can't backfill and recruit because of the threat of closure or the actual closure, it's got to have significant financial ramifications for the school to continue to be able to operate into the spring. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's on the table and it's something we'll have to watch and support and they'll have to watch and support and be responsive to. There's, no, there's just no question about it. However, all of those things are made much more difficult to manage in a condition of uncertainty that lingers on. The decision to act now is all the more important because of that uncertainty so that that planning can at least be made in an environment that knows what the transition will be about. Do we have a, uh, in terms of support, uh, do we have the capacity uh, to provide support perhaps in the way the state did with us under Connie Smith three or four years ago, putting our people in the school if they actually need that kind of support, right? If they can't recruit a teacher, but they've got 27 kids in a, or 25 kids in a class, and they can't hire a teacher, could we insert if they asked us to and paid? Can we help in that way and staff and? Well, certainly as long as there's finances for that, and then it's just a matter of negotiating and trying to figure out how best to meet the needs going forward. Dr. Brennan. Yes, we find ourselves in a situation that was similar to a situation last year about this time. Mm -hmm. And I think about the affect of, of the students, uh, their work ethic, the morale of the teachers. Um, it's to know that a school is going to close will Effect, it will affect the achievement level of the students. Mm -hmm. It is also demoralizing mm -hmm. uh, at this point to know that um, all that we do from now until May is going to be in vain. Um, that's my concern. As an educator, I'm thinking of the students and how this will impact their desire to learn in the future, um, the, the retention rate in the field of educators who are going to try to, we're trying to do their very best. Um, I'm very concerned about that. That's my thought. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. And um, Mr. Coverstone, I, I must agree with Dr. Brennan. Um, one thing that um, I've learned is that, in sitting in this seat, is that we get a lot of information. Um, I'm looking at a lot of information about the achievement of these students at Smiths and Craighead, and I see that a, most of it, if not all of it, is very negative, and that's unfortunate. Um, one thing that I can't get past is that whatever decision we make, we're making it on humans, not on numbers. And um, Dr. Brannon, I agree 100% uh, with, we have to consider the emotional detachment of these students. Um, even though these numbers are not reflective of what we want as far as achievement in this district in the slightest. I look at these children who have made emotional connections to other students, uh, to teachers, 
to the administrators. And I think um, if my fifth or sixth grader is being pulled out of a school, whether it's mid-year or at the end of the year, the anxiety that these children are going to feel going into a school that they're not familiar with, meeting new students and new teachers, that will definitely affect achievement. Um, I recognize that. I've seen that before. Um, on the flip side, and this is why the difficult, this is why this is such a difficult position to be in as a school board member. Um, you have to consider the um, the children first and foremost. You have to consider their education or the lack thereof. You have to consider if we leave them in this environment, how are they going to progress as they continue? You have to consider um, if right now I'm looking at these math scores that are 30%, a 30 percentage gap between Metro Average and uh, Smiths and Craighead, what are we preparing our students for? What is going to happen um, when they get to high school? Are they going to be further and further, be further, and further behind based on um, what we're looking at right now? Uh, it, it's a concern. And it is probably one of the most difficult positions um, that I, I and I think my colleagues are in right now because we have two things, two very important things to consider, academic achievement and our students. We are here first and foremost for our students. And part of that, part of being here for our students is to make sure that they achieve academically. And it, it's a crossroads. And I think everybody at this table right now is sort of feeling that pull. I completely understand and appreciate and totally respect the office or the work that your office is doing. I totally and completely appreciate the, the show of support from the Smithson Craighead family here tonight. Um, it says a lot on both ends. Um, and I'm rambling, but it just, I'm just kind of, it's kind of gotten me caught up in this thing when I think about um, what the outcome could be. Um, either way, there's going to be some disappointment. Um, and I do appreciate everything that you've done. I do appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Register. Yes, I'd like to make a comment, if I may. We've, we've uh, implemented a new zoning plan in this district. We opened schools, and, and we haven't closed too many, but we've opened schools and, uh, that, and made major changes in, in zoning <coughs> plans in this district. Uh, and that means change for students. And it means change for parents. And I will uh, relate this uh, recommended closing to many other activities that have taken place in this district. The mistake to make uh, is to not give people sufficient notice. Uh, and uh, this is the time uh, that is sufficient notice. Uh, if we uh, do not do this now, we're looking at a lost year this year and perhaps a lost year next year. And because that that timing cycle is really not going to change. Uh, so, uh, so I think I understand what you're saying, but the one mistake that we can make, I've been through many zoning plans and many closings and many openings, the one mistake to make is to not give parents ample time to look at their options and to make good decisions. Any further discussion? We will uh, have a roll call vote. Dr. Gentry, uh, I'm sorry, let me clarify. Roll call vote. Um, yes to uh, revoke the charter, no to uh, keep to keep the charter intact. Dr. Gentry. Uh, may I? I'm sorry. I guess I'm still confused. Okay. I, I really don't understand what this board believes is the alternative. And I'm still trying to understand if what I'm hearing is we all know it needs to be closed, but defer letting those words come out of our mouth until May 24th. I guess. I, well, the motion on the floor right now the is motion. a recommendation for re re revocation. I understand the motion, but I'm trying to kind of, I'm still confused as to, you know, I think the purpose of us all being here at the table is to kind of understand everybody's opinions. And I'm still not certain for those that are asking about probation. What does that really mean? Is it probation through the spring to then have this vote in May to close the school? Or is it in probation thinking that three years of performance that we're looking at is going to make a drastic change over the next six months? 
So I, I don't know if anybody else who's been talking about the probation thing wants to kind of clarify for me what it is, why is probation a palatable option? Quite honestly, I don't think it is. Just asking. I'm I not. don't think it is. And the reason that I asked about that was because I wanted to understand fully what the options could be. Um, and when I, again, when I go back to looking at these scores and I look at the achievement over the last three years, it scares me where our children might be in, ne in the next three years. Mm -hmm. it, it frightens me to think that right now we have positions in math and science that we cannot fill because we don't have um, adequately educated children coming out of our system to do so. And if we continue on this road, we will continue to keep our children behind. And that makes me very afraid. Um, I, while I do understand and I sympathize with the emotional detachment of every single child in the school, at the same time, if I would be remiss in, my, in performing my duties if I didn't recognize the gaps in achievement here. It is, it is too clear for me not to see that and to not think, not just for next year, but in the next two years, in the next three years, where are these students right now going to be when they graduate from high school? Will they be ready for college? Will they be ready for a career? If we continue to allow them to fall behind further and further and further, what are we saying to our students? As representatives of this Metro Board of Education, what are we saying to our students if we overlook what we have, the clear data that's right here in front of us? Um, I am extremely concerned about these percentage gaps, extremely concerned. And it has not, there's three years of data before us and the increases year over year have not been significant. Um, even if we drop 2010 off the page, the, the last two years of data have not been significant enough to move these children even to the halfway point of the district average. And that is very, very concerning for me. Um, any other discussion? Any other questions? Uh, Ms. Spearing. I'm going to ask another question. The, the idea that these kids have come in uh, and that they're, you know, 96% poverty, so they started low. And I, I absolutely agree with you. We've got to not only make a year's growth, we've got to make accelerated growth. Has the school, over the last two years, made at least a year's growth? Okay. That's no, absolutely not. And the charts in the back compare this school to schools with higher free and reduced lunch status, higher levels of English language learners that are performing at higher levels. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, the purpose of a charter school is to excel uh, over and above what our district schools are doing. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking if it's a charter school or a magnet school, the purpose of that school is to make these students should be excelling. I understand that there may have been, um, you know, a tough start for a lot of students. It, it happens. Um, it happens to a lot of students, and that's unfortunate. But if we have a charter school that is performing below well below our district average school. Again, that's very concerning to me. That's correct. That goes to Ms. Kim's question. For us to really raise the bar and to acknowledge the work that's happening with similarly situated populations among our, uh, among our other charter schools, we do have to have a performance framework that raises the bar above the bottom 5%. Here, we are dealing with the bottom 5% of schools statewide. We're not making fine distinctions at the 20th or 25th percentile. We, we have to do this, I, I believe firmly, in order to maintain any hope of continuing to move the district forward. Thank you. Mr. Pinkston, and then Mr. Hayes. I am uh, I'm struggling with this. Um, I know we all are. Um, e even if we do this tonight, the reality is the students and families will still be there for the remainder of the school year. And, and there will be the kind of human effect that Dr. Brannon is referencing, and, and I agree with that. Um, I want to go back to <coughs> something that Mr. Hayes kind of uh, referenced earlier. Is there no way, uh, Mr. Coverstone, to ask the state, which has said it wants to be a partner in all these conversations, to uh, help us fast track the data on this school after the end of the school year, return it to us quickly? And, and Dr. Reschner, I understand that, the, that, that even if that were possible, the net effect is, does compress the family decision making process, but I really do share the concerns that Dr. Brannon um, 
raised about morale, which could be a, a reality beginning tomorrow if we do this. And I just kind of want to ask, explore creatively what, what might be possible in terms of interaction with the state. Well, the tests are given the first week in May. So, I mean, practically speaking, I, even very quickly is, is June. Um, of course, we, we, I think, press the state to do this as quickly as possible at any, at any time. But, you know, the reality of a data-driven decision-making system is that this is always going to be the timeline. We have an early start, an early school year start. Again, next year we have a balanced calendar. Uh, chances of getting any data back that analyzes school-wide performance is very, very li limited. My, uh, and, and, and would put parents' uh, backs against the wall uh, uh, to in, in making decisions, and certainly us in staffing schools and planning. It is not a good planning process to wait till the middle to the end of the summer to determine whether a school stays open for the students involved, for the staffing, for the schools. Mr. Hayes, you had a comment? Uh, uh, a couple. Um, uh, and the, the first, I think, is, is somewhat procedural, and I brought this up a year or so ago when we discussed Drexel. Um, we talked about probation at the time. We placed them on probation. I made objections to the fact that probation didn't exist as a defined term, as an action that we could actually take. Uh, we did it anyway. Uh, we were supposed to reevaluate Drexel, who was in a probationary status in June of this year. We failed to take any action or review anything, again, because probation doesn't actually exist as an action that we have defined that we can take. To my knowledge, I could be mistaken there. Um, I think the second thing that, that, that I've thought a lot about uh, recently is, and this, is, this gets back to how charter schools are, are organized, um, and perhaps the unique power of a charter agreement. We, our board, has a contract with the board of directors of Smith and Craighead Middle Academy. That board has failed in their duty to hire an effective school leader to maintain an effective school leader or hire staff that can do the job. Uh, it's not about, I mean, it is about children at the end of the day, certainly. Uh, but our agreement is with their board of directors who have a contract with us, our board, not Dr. Register, not Mr. Coverstone, with us. We hired them. We hired them in a contract to perform a duty that they have not done. It is incumbent upon us to act this evening. Ms. Kim. Is the DEA administered It is. Are there any results from that this fall? There are. The DEA is not a um, you know, you know, an accountability test. It is, you know, used for diagnostic and informative support in the school and so on. Uh, there are, um, you know, I mean, there's, uh, suffice to say, there's no indication from that that things are dramatically different. But I would not even begin to make any decisions based on that because of its, you know, because it's not, it's not a tool for that. Sure. Um, and one thought, I mean, yeah, my heart is so happy at this whole thing. Um, I mean, this, this, this deck of six slides is, is without question, as you noted, Ms. May is daunting. Um, I think that is just undeniable. Um, I, I was trying to think through, too, like, like taking the numbers aside, although I'll come back, well, let me, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to slice and dice the data in different ways. I'm trying to think about, are they gonna, is my blood too low? Is it too high? Like, how do I orient myself to, to what we see, you know, in this deck? on screen. Um, and I was just looking at the, the, the data that was just released, you know, by the state, um, and looking at the rest of the charters, you know, of which we have eight out of 40 plus at the middle school level. Um, and for, it was striking, you know, four of the top 10 performers in math achievement, just straight achievement, are charters. 
um, four of the top 10 performers in math growth are actually charters. Three of the top 10 performers in reading achievement, just absolute achievement, are charters. And then five of the top 10 performers in reading growth are also charters. And between 86% and 93% of the students in those, all those charters, are free and reduced lunch eligible, which, put, which puts them well above the average um, of the broader system. I think it's 72% roughly. Um, and so put another way, even though charters make up less than 20% of our total middle school population, um, they're overrepresented in the, the highest performing schools. So roughly 30 to 50% of the highest performing schools are in fact charters. Um, in every single subject, every single category. Um, so, so the good news, at some level, is that the charter school, broadly speaking, is thriving. Um, I, I think that we should take heart in that. Um, and I think that the thing for me is that it also, in the context of this, provides proof points for what is possible for our kids. And, and when I think about why I'm in the, in the work and why I work so hard every single day, whether my day job, which is all at Orient or this, it's because I believe that kids actually can be put on a different life path that they're not that <coughs> different from me when I was in middle school that I fully expected to go to college. Um, I hoped to get a college athletic scholarship. I did. And you need academic performance to do that. You need academic performance in order to reach all your dreams and to be positioned to actually have choice. And, and I think, yeah, I, I just needed to get that out there. I think that, that's, that, that is how I'm thinking about it. And, and at the same time, my heart is deeply heavy by this decision. Um, Any further discussion? Right, we will call for the vote. Uh, I will restate the motion on the table. The motion is the, the recommendation to revoke the Smithson Craighead Middle School Charter effective May 24th, 2013. The motion has been made and properly second. Uh, we will have a roll call vote. Um, again, if you are, um, if your vote is to revoke the charter, please respond by saying yes. If your vote is to is not the revocation of the charter, please respond by saying no. Dr. Gentry. Yes. Dr. Brannon. No. Ms. Spearing. Yes. Ms. Kim. Yes. Ms. Shepard. Yes. Mr. Pinkston. Yes. Mr. Hayes. Yes. Ms. Froge. Yes. And my vote is yes as well. That is um, eight yeses, one no, motion carries. We will move on to the director's report. Dr. Register. Madam Chair and members of the board, I will uh, ask Associate Superintendent Brenda Steele, Associate Superintendent for Elementary Schools, come to the podium and we'll wait a moment, Ms. Steele, if you uh, mind.
did um, did Miss Steele leave also? <laughs> I'm getting my team, <laughs> but they can't get in. Wow. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Register, and board members. Um, my name is Brenda Steele, and I serve as co-chair. My name is Robin Veenstra Vanderweel, and I'm the community co-chair of this TLG. And what I'm going to say is this time last year, uh, you saw us in another role. We served as co-chair for the Performance of Disadvantaged Students Transformational Leadership Group. And today, I'm so excited that we serve as co-chairs for the Elementary Transformational Leadership Group. Uh, before we start, it's an honor for me because I have the, uh, the joy of working with some wonderful uh, individuals. And I think they're really talented in their attempt to uh, do the job that we're here for, and that's to serve children. And I like the members of the team that are here. Uh, would you please stand? As we begin all meetings and planning sessions, we review the MNPS vision statement. And as we look at this vision, all activities and recommendations are made with the understanding that we are providing the foundation for the boys and girls of Nashville to be successful in education, work, and life. Our next slide represents the number of uh, students and, uh, that are advanced and proficient on TCAP in grades three and four. And you have other uh, information in, your, uh, in our report. You will notice that there is a continuous gain in all areas. However, we are striving to make substantial gains in all subject areas. We need to celebrate the successes. We have answered several questions, and one of them is, where are we now? We've started with Common Core State Standards, and they were adopted, you know, by 47 states. Uh, they're more rigorous standards in math and English, and they were developed to prepare our students for college and career. And the, the standards determine the knowledge and skills that students are expected to learn in each grade and subject. Teaching and learning will include uh, more critical thinking and problem solving, and even though I say, I'm saying elementary tier, we started this, these endeavors with the K through 12 in mind, and I want you to know that. Uh, as far as 2011 and 12, we partnered with the state where 60 of our instructional coaches were trained so that we could properly implement our Common Core standards. And so in 2011-12, our K through 2 teachers were trained and staff and principals and so forth. Uh, in 2012-13, which is now, of course, uh, we have implementation of our third and fourth grade uh, Common Core standards. And further discussion will be uh, continued during our next board uh, work session. Next, we have problem-based, uh, project-based learning. That's a K through 12 tool that we uh, will use. And it can be used to implement our Common Core standards. And the lessons are designed using the standards as the content requiring students to think more critically, communicate, and collaborate as they learn. We have responsive classroom. If you go to any school in Metro, you will see morning meetings being held. And the purpose of them uh, is that they foster a warm and inviting climate and culture for learning to happen. And there are four parts to the responsive classroom or morning meeting. You will see a morning message in the classroom. There's, there are greetings being held. There's a sharing activity. And then there is another activity that students could participate in. The last uh, implement or new implementation that we've done is uh, with our comp, which is classroom organization and management. And this is a K through 12 initiative as well. We've trained 24 teachers in K through 12. 
uh, to assist classroom teachers in successfully working with students to provide a conducive learning, envir learning environment. We have Doug Granier, who is our uh, district coach who works with them and uh, will work with any teacher that needs assistance as well as other training opportunities made available. As we move forward, we want to ensure that students, uh, as they exit third grade, that they are proficient or above in reading. That is one of our goals, and we are really striving to make that happen. Not only is it our goal, but it is a state goal. Uh, we want to ensure that we're reaching every classroom, providing teachers and students the support they need to be successful in meeting and exceeding their targets. And I said meeting and exceeding. Common Core Standards is something that is really an uh, uh, interest for, uh, for us this year as well as for next year. We want to ensure that we are successfully implementing Common Core not only in the elementary but K through 12. And then of course providing our families uh, the support they need to ensure that our students are being successful. So some of the challenges to this work, you've asked for us to give you some thoughts on how, how we're doing this work, but also some of the things that are difficult about it. And so um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges our T TLG is working to address and, um, and is still trying to figure out the best strategies. Um, ensuring that every classroom um, teacher, every um, facilitator of learning, every person who has a relationship with the student has the skills and tools needed to implement these four new initiatives is a massive amount of work. And um, Brenda did describe sort of the degree of which we've been able to offer PD and the degree to which we've been able to provide coaching and things like that. But there's, it's a substantive amount of work, especially at the elementary school level where you have so many communities that we need to support as we roll out these new initiatives. We're also looking at expanding the impact and the reach of our current pre-K system. So this involves looking strategically at what, what are, how are we having the most impactful possible existing pre-K classrooms, and then having a strategic plan for expanding the reach of those classrooms. So um, are there communities that are severely underserved? Is there a way that we can um, expand that work and provide high quality early education to our most vulnerable students and families across the district? Um, and the challenges figuring out both of those those actions at the same time. Um, and then the last one is, is equipping all of our instructional leaders and families with the tools they need to improve student achievement. So while there may be transformational things happening at the classroom level in terms of supporting um, excellent excellent instructional leaders and really creating dynamic learning opportunities for our students and our teachers, we need to make sure that we're translating the impact and the scope of all of that work to our families and to our community partners so that we can really maximize our out of school time investments in community partnerships and that we can really make sure that parents understand the new high standards that are expected for their, for their learners at the elementary school level and how some of these programs are gonna help support and also accelerate the pace of learning for their students. So that's a challenge that we're, that we're working, toward, working to address. Um, it's been a long night and you've had a lot on your plate tonight, but we did want to provide a time for you to um, give us some questions or engage in some discussion about just this snapshot of what's happening at the elementary school TLG. I have questions. Ms. Shepard, Ms. Cam, and then Ms. Spearing, and Mr. Hayes. <clears throat> Great information, by the way. Thank you for sharing this. Um, on, on the first goal that you stated um, for uh, elementary school students, ensure that students exit third grade is as proficient in reading, proficient or above. What is, what is proficient, what defines proficient? When we talk about proficient in advance, we are talking about our TCAP scores. Right. And they determine after taking the TCAP whether a student is proficient and there is a uh, score for that. So what we're doing, not only in just third grade, but this has to begin as soon as students enter school. So what are we doing in those early grades to ensure by the time they get in third grade that they're already proficient? So that's a goal that we've had. How do we work, uh, how do we help uh, schools decide interventions? What are they doing as far as reading is concerned? And we're improving, but incremental, and we want to uh, improve more. 
And just on a personal note, having visited the blended pre-K program at Hermitage Elementary, that classroom is a, it's just phenomenal. It's amazing what the teacher does in that classroom. Ms. Kim? I'll try to it. One is um, just understanding the full cycle of continuous improvement. Um, I'm flying a little blind. I'm trying to understand how this group is or is not involved with, for example, like a development performance dashboard. So after the first administration of the DEA, we can actually eyeball that. It's not perfect, but my understanding it's our best predictor of TCAP results that we have, and there are three administrations of it right there. Um, and so it would be interesting to just eyeball the, you know, the results at each deadline um, and ask ourselves critical questions of what do we learn? What are the bright spots? How can we actually translate that across other schools? And especially on the heels of that very last traumatic vote, I just think that we can do so much more to set up everyone for success, um, but it's going to have to take a tight cycle of management throughout, and I don't know if this group is the one that, I don't know, yeah. Okay. We do use the DEA scores, and where you're talking about continuous improvement, we're definitely using the eight-step process to determine whether schools are progressing. So therefore, you will, if you go to, say, several of our schools that are maybe having difficulty and not reaching our benchmarks, we have just started that process, but high school already started continuous improvement maybe a year or so ago, so our schools now are implementing it as well ensuring that if you look at those scores, where is it or where do we need to go in order for students to improve? Where, In other words, we have data notebooks on our children and we have that material. I could have brought it here. It's a notebook this big. What are they doing for each individual child to ensure that they are progressing? And we have that material. And I think to the point about sort of the role of this group as it relates to data-informed decision-making and, and moving the ball down the field, I think what happens internally is, is exactly what you just described. And going forward, we now have more, more capacity to take that, those same early indicators and talk about them with the community partners and, and with parents and community at the table to say, here's where we're at, and, this is, and these are some ways that you can support the learning that occurs between eight and three. But not only that, you are able to give that information to parents right. because they need to know exactly where is my child as far as how they're improving and what's going on with their education. So this information is not only for the school, but it will assist the parent in knowing right. where my child is. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other questions, Ms. May I help you? We'll just take a second for our media family to, co to collect their toys. <laughs> our toys have to be collected, sorry about that. <laughs> Please take your choice. <laughs> Although I am curious, are there any early returns that you know that we can speak of regarding the DEA and what that has led you to think, feel, want to do? When you say early returns for DEA, DEA is predictive. So in other words, what it tells us is where the children are right now. And we've only taken one. We're taking the other one this week. So what we'll be able to do is look at, say, the first DEA results and this one to see exactly where our children are or did we see the growth that we're hoping that we're making. Ms. Baring. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, too, like Ms. Kim, have several questions. Um, one of my concerns is the reading scores of third grade, 39.8 on the achievement test. Third, fourth, and fifth grade, I think, were up there. Um, uh, is that right? I can't really see it. Third and fourth grade. And third is definitely the lowest. Um, this is a great concern to me. And um, what types of interventions, you said that there are interventions the, at the elementary level. What types of interventions do you have ongoing? It depends on the school. We have Voyager, which uh, several schools are using. Uh, but then, of course, they could be using Head Sprout, which is an early reading program that we have in about uh, 15 to 20 of our schools. And early reading really 
uh, is guaranteed if it is used appropriately that children in grades K through two would be reading at grade level. And how many years have you been using it? This is our second year to use early reading. How read. many years does it take in order to get that guarantee? If it were, was used with fidelity, and that's what we keep saying, it is important that if we recommend that schools w use programs with fidelity, they will see the results. So you're saying they're not using them with fidelity? In some. Okay, what, what can be done about that? That's where we go into the schools, and if we're going to purchase any type of intervention or whatever, it is important that the schools as well as the teachers are receptive to the program and they see the value in it as well. If I say it's mandated, then it's not going to be used appropriately. Okay. And that's even we have reading recovery in our schools, but there's still no guarantee that they're going to go in there and still utilize those skills as well. Uh, so we, we work hard to ensure that they are doing it. Unfortunately, reading recovery is in very few schools, as you know. Uh, I'm also concerned about the fact that we don't have a definition of reading uh, or emergent literacy even in our metro schools. And because of this, I th I'm afraid that we have a mismatch of materials, a mismatch of programs, a mismatch of assessments. I think kids are confused. I think teachers are confused. And um, one of my examples is that um, uh, we use, and I think you noted on here that um, uh, Fontes and Pinnell is used. And Fontes and Pinnell has a completely different philosophy than the assessment with Dibbles. I, I was just talking to Fred Carr about the Dibbles this week. And on the Dibbles assessment, we're asking teachers to teach nonsense words. We're asking our children to read something called nonsense words, and there is no such thing as a nonsense word. Nonsense word, it's an oxymoron. Either a word has meaning or it carries meaning. There's no such thing. And yet, I just heard the other day about a parent going into a school to do some volunteer work, and the, the parent was asked to work with letters, and the child was allowed to use these letters to make either words or nonsense words. You know, what does that tell the child about reading? And, and the whole reason we read is for meaning. So these are things that I'm very concerned about with, with our overall, with our reading program. Could we discuss that later, after tonight? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that'll be fine. Absolutely. Let me see if I had anything else. Okay, that's all right now. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Hayes. Thank you. Uh, could, could you flip to the, the next slide? Sure. Uh, back. Uh, I'm looking at the percent of MMPS students proficient in advance on TCAP grade three. Just, it's not on that. Use. This In is, my package, it was the next slide. We gave you the slides for all of it. We did not want to leave anything out, but we did not put it on the presentation. But go, you can go on and ask um, your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm trying to discern from this slide how far ahead or below the benchmark you are, or we are. Uh, what does the state expect of us? Uh, reading language arts, for example, we've got 40.8. What's the state benchmark? We were about a point two behind. So we did not meet benchmark in reading, but we met it in math. So reading language arts was a 41 and we were a 40 right, our benchmark was right. Something. Math was a 40.6, well, and it was a, what was math? Math was about a 46, I believe, for last year. So um, we were five and a half points behind benchmark? Yeah. No, we met benchmark. We exceeded math. it. We exceeded in math. It's reading that we're below benchmark. Science? Science, we are, uh, we met our benchmark in science. You know, and social studies, even though we are a lower. You're asking about third grade in specific, and she's giving you third grade uh, uh, numbers. Yeah, no, this, this is third. Don't, don't look at that. Look at, yeah. look at your slide presentation. If yeah. we look at so uh, so math was 49. We and math the state benchmark was 49. We hit 49. We met our benchmark in all areas except reading, reading and we were approximately let's say 1.2 behind as far as reading was concerned. 
your your goal? Uh, so our you? goal for this year would be 40, I think it was 46 or something like that. Your, your goal is every student. Your goal is every student. I think that's all. Right. Goal. It would be every third and fourth. Student. Right. So Three you, through eight, rather. Uh, what do you think the timeline looks like for every student to be proficient in it or advanced? Now, I can't give you a timeline, but what we're saying is every student before they leave third grade, regardless of whether you want it or I want it, they have to be proficient. And if they are not proficient, we must provide some form of intervention. And that's a state requirement as well. So my, I guess my question is, is how long uh, do you have to move every student to proficient, or do we have as a district? And, and this could be the way Dr. Register holds you accountable for your job. How long do you have to move every student to proficient or advanced? How has that been established? How, are, how, how does this board gauge that you have been successful in meeting the goal of every student proficient or advanced? What, what we can do is um, look at, when you said me, well, so if, if, if what we're if this doing is, is looking at all schools, that's the reason I'm saying we need to make sure that we're providing our teachers with the support they need to ensure that children are learning. So that's why we're providing professional development and so forth. Are we going to meet those, th this requirement next year? I cannot tell you that. But what we're trying to do is make sure that we reduce that number of students that are not proficient by providing them the support that they need. I guess maybe I could rephrase the question. How do we know if you have been um, successful in your mission, in our shared mission, to have every student uh, finish the third grade or the fourth, the fourth grade, whatever, whatever metric we're looking at as proficient or advanced? And, and so I think about this as we have, we have hired Dr. Register who has tasked you with this. How do we know that you've, when you come back to us next year, Right? How do we know that you've been successful, or that, that he has been successful in selecting you for this Herculean task? Right? I mean, it's 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 a lot of work, and I've, I've I've read your grant application and the work that you're doing, and it's it's really 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 challenging. Um, and and I think about particularly what do you need specifically in first and second grade, so that by the time we measure in third grade, to make sure that we're successful, what what can we as a board do to support you? and to support Dr. Retro, because I haven't heard that, and I haven't seen, well, we're, yeah, right, here's the target. How do we support you to move towards every student being proficient or advanced? I Quickly. really, I think we need to all continue to look at what we're doing in the classroom, ensuring, again, like I said, that we're giving the teachers the support they need. And what we have to remember, regardless of, of, of what goes on, is every year there is a, a new, I will say a new group coming in that would be teaching reading to students. So we have to ensure that we provide them with the support they need in order to go into the classrooms and teach reading. Now you say, if it was, what do we have to say that would say that we're improving? I would say as long as we are showing this growth, and, and when I say incremental, I don't want incremental growth. I really want substantial growth. So as long as we're, I really told the schools, I, we need to have 50 or percent or more students reading at proficient. And, and I've given schools targets. So if we get 50 percent, that's a goal. We keep pushing until we get as many as we can. Do you think it's reasonable that we can expect that based on what you know today in two years? I think with the strategies we, we're using with continuous improvement, with going into the schools, monitoring with uh, what we're expecting, I think so. I honestly do. I, I, I really <laughs> think our teachers are trying uh, hard to do what is needed to support what we're doing. But I think the key to some of this will be our common core expectations. Uh, they're requiring that students think more critically. They're asking teachers to teach a whole different way. So we should see a change. So I, I, I want to uh, say something about that. I want to I want to try to respond to your question in a different way. I think it's uh, certainly a good question, one we have to pay attention to. But the, the game changes a little bit for us, if you will, when we we're adopting Common Core, and then after Common Core is put into place, the testing changes. Mm -hmm. We go to a completely new assessment system. It's called PARC. Uh, and we'll be glad to talk to you about that. But I, I think what you have to understand about 
standardized data like this is that we have to measure growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, aren't, there aren't radical changes. We've got to make sure that, and as, as uh, Ms. Steele says, we've got to make sure that we're meet, step number one, meet or exceed, mm -hmm. and hopefully exceed the benchmarks that are set every year. And the state determines those. We don't determine those benchmarks. A big one that we haven't talked about, closing the achievement gap. So not only do we meet the benchmarks, but, but we, our subgroups have to improve, all of them, and we have to close the gap. Those are the two standards that the state sets, and we met uh, most of those this year. Are we satisfied with that progress? The answer is no. I'm not satisfied with 35% or 49%. Uh, none of us should be satisfied with that. But we also have to be realistic about what can, how quickly those scores can change. We need to increase the progress. We need to do that. Uh, I think Mr. Coverstone's example uh, that he used earlier in different contexts is really important. Bottom 5%, our expectation is 10% improvement. That's more than double the benchmark uh, for, the, for, the, for the lowest performing schools. We want to more than double the benchmark. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, in another two years, I guess it's two, is that correct, Paul? The whole yes. testing program changes 2014. again. As it did, as it did, uh, how many years ago? Three years Three ago. Three years ago. When we went to uh, new standards. And so we were, uh, uh, the percentage proficient or advanced is, is important, mm -hmm. uh, but it also varies because we were up about 80%, 85% before <coughs> the standards changed. Uh, that's what Governor Bredesen took on and changed. And, uh, and so let's look at that, but, but I think the key to standardized testing is, are we, make, are we growing, are our kids are getting, getting better with the greater expectations, and are we progressing at faster rates, and are we closing the achievement gap? So uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a simple answer to say, how do we know if we're making satisfactory progress? Start with the benchmarks that the state says. Well, and, and that's to some degree because of all the, the and I think I've mentioned this before, and I, I certainly appreciate your answer. Because of all the changing in standards and expectations, I've focused on the ACT, which doesn't seem to have changed, right? I mean, as a, it, it is a, and, and maybe they change the language in the test and they change the questions. Uh, and I know, I know that ACT is the longest, right? It's the longest score to move. Uh, it is. It, it and, takes years. And so, and so, what what are the variables involved in in uh, looking and measuring ACT? change over the last few years. Well, the, the biggest variable is that we went from testing less than 50% of the students to testing all of them to 100%. 100% of our students take the test. Now, there's a pretty good measure for looking at ACT compared to the state. We, our test scores went up faster than the state's. Uh, we're about two-tenths of a point faster than the state, if I remember correctly. Is that correct, Paul? Uh, two-tenths of a percent improvement over state average in ACT is significant, and I'll underline that, because ATC scores do not change rapidly. Uh, you've got a long window for seeing the effect on that. Our scores this year increased two-tenths of a point faster than the state increase. Uh, now, we're still below state average, but we're catching up. We're closing the gap, and in a pretty significant way. And I think when you see what happens when some of these programs are implemented that we're that we're implementing now that that progress will pick up on ACT scores. Any further discussion? I've got a question. Um, I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about how you're expanding the reach and impact of pre-K programs um, because I see a great need for that in our schools um, and I also kind of this may be outside of your area, your area of expertise but sort of maybe talk a little bit about how this maybe plays in with funding and legislation um, and how we're moving forward with expanding our programming? We have the um, Phyllis Phillips is uh, pre-K, uh, our director for pre-K, and we have been working with the mayor's office as far as what, how pre-K looks and, and what our expectations. Uh, our goal is hopefully to uh, increase pre-K to classrooms per year if there's room in schools. Uh, we even uh, we're going to look at the budget this year to see what that looks like. Last year, we were able to open two classes at Cane Ridge. Uh, we are partnering with United Way and other agencies because they have outside pre-K programs. 
But our goal is not only to look at the students that we serve, but look at other pre-K students. So we're partnering with other uh, agencies that are community-based to make sure that we're working with them in, sh in sharing what we're doing uh, in, at MNPS. So hopefully we can continue to see the growth in the pre-K program here. So, so they're, we're providing the space, but they're providing the teachers? Or how does that work the, as a par partnership? I think it's, it's, it's the other way around. The community, uh, we, we evaluate the teachers to ensure that their program. Uh, we have about three community-based sites, and we have individuals that go to those sites and evaluate to make sure the program is running smoothly. And then, uh, as far as the teachers are concerned, they are Metro teachers, and of course they get our training as well. And I think the initiative that um, Brenda's referencing with the mayor's office really looks at early care and education opportunities that go beyond Zero. our Metro pre-K programs. And so what's happening in Head Start classrooms, what's <coughs> happening in our private pre-K or early care and education settings that we can really have a platform where we all understand the expectations of Common Core standards in kindergarten so that we're leveraging the investments across the city for our young learners in a more effective and targeted way so that we have a measure for ready on K for the first day of school for kindergarten so that everybody understands sort of what is the expectation of Common Core and how does that change your understanding of what kindergarten ready might mean um, and, and, and how to adapt programming, whether it be our, our own internal programming. But the other component is in the district, the pre-K classrooms that we do have, one of our challenges is, use, is finding resources to bring new curriculum to those pre-K settings so that, so that, they, so that the pre-K classrooms are uh, some of the best possible early care and education opportunities that our young children do experience in the city. So, it's both making sure the existing investment is as effective as possible and also looking at leveraging the, the total investments to all be aligned with where, where the district is headed. But we're not increasing the number of classrooms in our school at this point. The in goal is two classrooms we're, a year to see oh, every, district okay, I'm sorry. That's our goal. Okay, district wide. Right. Mr. Pinkston. Um, follow on, on the pre-K question. Um, Shamed I don't know the answer to this, I should be more articulate in this, but pre-K, the growth of pre-K over the last decade has primarily been a function of state dollars and availability and expansion. And have we been adding classrooms that have not been uh, funded in that way or, or and we're just doing it through our own operating budget and our community partnerships? You could just kind of talk about a little bit about what impact the availability or lack thereof of state funds does I think I had in, in or outside the BEP. I know that's a complicated question. Right now we have 146 pre-K classes. I think we've continuously grown through the past couple of years. But last year was the first year we added two more since I believe uh, maybe two years ago. So when you're talking about funding, if we're to increase because we're not getting any extra state funding or anything, it has to be MNPS funding. That's the reason I'm trying to put it in the budget for us to at least try to increase by two classes. And I think that's about 200,000 if we were to do that. Okay. And I um, just want to click back to the discussion that was happening earlier about um, growth and kind of just the overall just conversation about how we were moving in in a generally positive direction. Um, I've had this conversation with Dr. Register, and this is probably more appropriate and a chair to talk about when we have the next work session around Common Core. But I feel, you know, overall good about what I knew intuitively um, when we were, when I was running and, and being able to see it from the inside that things are pointed in the right direction. I feel like the opportunity for this board, this new board, is to challenge ourselves to kind of hit the gas pedal on acceleration and figure out you know, what are the things that we can do to challenge ourselves and talk uh, about with, with, uh, with management and the, and the whole team to really accelerate improvement uh, because, you know, if, if our goal is, is all students ultimately ready mm -hmm. for a career or college and life, um, then you know, maybe what this board does is put a greater sense of urgency around getting there faster. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of what does that look like and how what are the strategies for getting there? So I don't have the answer. I defer to the educators on the, on the board, but uh, this is my editorial comment that was running through my mind listening to that previous part of the discussion. I think you're correct. I think it, it would be a great uh, 
discussion to have during the work session as we discuss Common Core because I've got a lot of questions, kind of the same thing going in my head. Um, any further discussion? Questions? One, I'm sorry. I totally agree with that. I mean, the awesome thing, I mean, this is just one um, chart of all of our schools lined up. I mean, the awesome thing is that we have a bunch of schools here that are just killing it. Right. And I am dying to know, you know, what they're doing. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and I would love to, yeah, have a panel. I don't know what the exact format is, but to hear directly from them. What do they do? This is not by accident. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of hard work went into that. Lots of teachers committing themselves, probably trying out new things, innovating, doing all, everything that's necessary to drive that. And I think focusing on those bright spots would be highly informative, get to the acceleration point, it'd be fun. And before uh, I leave, I, uh, the, I would just like to say our teachers are really working hard. Uh, they uh, attend our training sessions and they are really looking at Common Core and delving into them and trying to ensure that they are teaching our students what's needed. And really it's a whole new way uh, when you think of the critical questions that are being asked. And I think we'll discuss this later, even with our constructive response. Uh, we might give you all one of those tests so you can see what our children actually have to go through and what we're requiring. So I'm really encouraged with, uh, with what our teachers and our principals are doing in the schools. And I see elementary as well as K through 12 moving. And uh, with the implementation of Common Core, I know with any new uh, any new standards, is there's a learning process. So, so we are in a learning process. Is this going to be one of those, are you smarter than a fifth grader tests? It yeah. possibly could. Okay. But I'll give you the fourth grade. Okay. Just give us a study age, we'll be fine. <laughs> Dr. Register. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair and members of the board, uh, our, the next part of the director's report is uh, to uh, briefly speak to the charter school application process. I think you've had this in advance. I'm sure you've had this in advance, and hopefully you've had an opportunity to talk about it. And, uh, the last Mr. Coverstone to highlight just the uh, changes or improvements in this process. Yes, thank you. I will take just a few moments, and then whatever questions or comments, as I told you when I distribu distributed them to you, we're always open to feedback. This is not in and of itself a board level policy. This is our operating policy under your expectations, and so we're interested because of you know how directly this affects you in the contracting process uh, for any feedback or suggestions that you have, whether in this forum or otherwise. But um, did have the opportunity to share with you those revisions in both the uh, applicant guide and the charter review process. Uh, the law was amended substantially in several ways last year and uh, incorporating those changes I think has a positive effect on our overall uh, approach. Uh, first of all, the law introduced a $500 application fee, which we think is a quality move, but um, will also enable us to begin the process of moving toward greater professionalization and sort of repeat business among our uh, committee review members. Um, nationwide, the going rate is, I think, about about $7,500 for an application or a few applications to be reviewed. We've paid these people nothing uh, and given them 10 and 12 applications per year over the years. Dr. Brandon certainly uh, leads the league in applications read. And, um, you know, Mr. Pinkson, you have a long way to go to catch up with uh, Dr. Brandon. Um, but we think that'll enable us to tighten up those committees to um, offer a little bit to defray their extra time and effort. So we think that'll be a, a positive step, albeit, you know, not as as much uh, in terms of quantity as, as it might seem on first blush. Secondly, the review period was extended to 90 days. I think that's the most significant change in the law. Again, the industry standard's probably more like six months. We went from 60 days now to 90 days, and we will make great use of that. We've introduced, uh, we'll have the ability to interview all applicants and not have to make the cut before the interview process, which again is industry standard and, and something that enables us to get a much fuller view of the capacity of the organization. Um, that will also offer opportunities for those of you who wish to be aware of, um, you know, what the applicants are about, so on, to, to take part in that as well. We've also introduced a public comment process to rationalize the uh, process of lining up here.
here to a real process instead that is um, devoted to a thorough review of the application. So we think those are some quality improvements. Uh, we've embedded the NAXA principles and standards in the review guidance and, and will increasingly speak about our decisions and the things that we're recommending to you and the decisions that you're asked to make in terms of those principles and standards. Remember that organization is um, absolutely in favor of high quality charter schools, but uh, you know, quality on both ends of the spectrum in terms of uh, being diligent in reviewing applications for their likelihood to deliver on their promises before they're open because, as we know, the disruption on the back end is always there, no matter um, how uh, much we would like to address that differently. Uh, I I'll sort of leave it at that. Our, our letters of intent for charter operators are due uh, February 1st, 2013. It's not that far away from us. We can go ahead and uh, publish this material. Um, we already have a a couple of uh, operators who've been in touch with us and we'll continue to try to make sure that they have everything that they need in order to um, process their applications and, um, and and to help them through the process and and anytime I'm talking about policies and procedures I have to reference Carol who is who is here and has stayed here and who is largely responsible for keeping all the uh, ins and outs of this operation and the the details of the office moving forward and um, she's a real credit to the to the profession and, and I owe her a debt of gratitude that I, I should Express publicly as well. Any questions or comments that I need at this time? Ms. Shepard? Um, Ellen, um, on your key dates that you have there, your, your letter of intent says January 30th, is, and you just stated February 1st. Is it February 1st or January 30th? Where do you see that? On your instructions page. I have letter of intent February 1st. Is it mistyped somewhere else? Okay. Um, is it on yours that way? It says mm -hmm. January 30th. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, I need to, I should probably get one of those back and compare it to this version. <laughs> well, I have mine electronically. Okay. It says first round interviews, May 6th through 10th, public comment, May. Oh, oh, hold on a second. Carol's correcting me. I need to, yes. Oh, I apologize. Well, I was not aware. Uh, okay. This just in. <laughs> Uh, we work, of course, closely with the State Department of Education's Charter Schools Office. Carol tells me that um, Rich Hagelin recommended changing to January 30th, so I need to say out loud that it is January 30th uh, in order to have the full 60 days um, ahead of the application period. So, Okay. Apologize Basically, for that. my question is um, they have first round interviews, public comment, and then second round interviews. Will there be an opportunity for public comment after the second round interviews? Uh, we hadn't laid it out that way um, at this point. Um, I mean, we could we could discuss that, but we we we, we were just uh, you know, I mean, I, I I think the the reason to do it at that point is because it gives us an opportunity to follow up on those comments with a more in-depth set of interview questions um, and whether to do it again after that point. I guess we just didn't, we don't have a lot of time, but I think okay. we didn't really think that would add substantially to it. Open to discussion about that, but for now that was our thinking. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? I've done so well on those two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for your feedback. And, and as always, I mean, this is a process that we're running on behalf of you and making recommendations for you. So we're open to any feedback that you have. And we certainly want to have it. Thanks. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. We will move on to committee reports. Uh, Council of Great City Schools, Dr. Brennan. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Madam Chair. I attended the 56th annual conference of the Council of Great City Schools during October the 17th through the 21st in Indianapolis, Indiana. The council continues to lead the charge of advocacy for 67 urban school districts throughout the United States. It represents six million uh, students. To qualify, the population must, must be at least 250,000 and have at least 35,000 students in their school system or they must be the largest school system in the state. The council is our champion and advocate on Capitol Hill as they lobby for legislation that benefits all students. We benefit from the comprehensive research that is done by the council. They serve as consultants to many districts and provide assistance for our local needs and publish materials 
and public service announcements for all of the members, educators, parents, and communities. This year, the conference strands covered a wide range of topics. The areas uh, of concern were achievement gaps, professional development, and I would like to mention that Errol Wyman uh, presented uh, teacher leaders developing a leadership pipeline along with Susan Thompson from MNPS. They did a great job. Leadership governance and management was one of the strands. Financial management, bilingual refugee and immigrant education, and special ed. The council also recognizes the work of effective leaders, school board members, and superintendents on alter alternating years. This year, the Richard Green Award was uh, presented to Dr. Carol Johnson, superintendent of the Boston Public Schools. Once again, the council will support the Bernard Harris Scholarship with Exxon uh, to four minority seniors who plan to major in science, and I will be distributing the application information to principals and guidance counselors very shortly. It has been my pleasure to serve as a representative of our board at these conferences, uh, and I'm also able to serve on the executive committee and have been for the past three years. I share the annual report for the Council of Great City Schools with each of you tonight. Thank you, that ends my report. Thank you, Dr. Brannon. Uh, TSBA annual convention, Ms. Shepard. The Tennessee State School Board Association held their annual conference at the Opperland Hotel on um, <coughs> Friday, uh, November 2nd through Tuesday, November the 6th. Those of us uh, attending that I saw were Dr. Brannon, Chairwoman Mays, and myself. The opening session was held Sunday evening where students from our own um, National School of the Arts put on an exhilarating performance. They were absolutely fabulous. The keynote speaker that night was Michael Thurmond, who delivered an inspiring and witty message to us all to close uh, Sunday session. The um, Coalition of Large School Systems class, um, of which MMPS is a member, held their meeting on, at 7.30 on Monday morning, and I think I have a colleague that will speak more to the detail of that. Um, joining the three of us were um, former school board member Mark North and Dr. Register as well. And then um, the attendees at the conference were given uh, many options to attend various clinics throughout uh, the day on Monday. Our own Mark Chamberlain, who's the customer service manager from MMPS, conducted a session on Monday morning. He did a fantastic job telling everybody how, what, what our customer service um, looks like here in MMPS. He had many questions from the audience and had the pleasure of moderating that clinic. It was a very, um, it was a great conference. I enjoyed um, attending. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. Uh, Mr. Pinkston, class. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I actually was unable to attend the class annual meeting on November 5th due to a previous personal commitment, but I was briefed ahead of time and afterward by Mr. Gowan, who, who manages the class initiative. And he told me, for those of you who were there, please fill in any additional detail, but this meeting essentially was a review of state legislative issues from 2012 and a discussion of issues the class expects to be on the radar during the upcoming legislative session, which begins in January, um, less than two months from now. Uh, for anyone uh, watching at home or uh, in the audience, uh, as a reminder, CLASS is the Coalition of Large School Systems, which is comprised of MNPS, Knox County Schools, Hamilton County Schools, and Memphis and Shelby County Schools. Uh, the mission of CLASS is to advocate in the General Assembly either for or against policies that affect our school systems, which obviously have unique needs relative to rural and uh, some suburban systems. Um, Briefly, or basically looking at the legislative tea leaves, class expects the two biggest issues facing our large school systems will be, number one, a uh, proposal to create vouchers uh, in Tennessee, which would be unprecedented, and number two, on the heels of our charter debate uh, here in Nashville, proposals for a state charter authorizer. Um, first, on the issue of vouchers, uh, Governor Haslam has had a task force looking at this issue. It met for the last time today, and according to the preliminary news reports, the task force is recommending that if a voucher system is created in Tennessee, that it should be focused on low-income students. 
Um, I haven't yet had the time to review the details of exactly what's being recommended, and we don't know if this will be included in the governor's legislative package. Uh, but regardless, I think we will see legislation from someone uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, class has been opposed to vouchers, and the membership restated its opposition last week. Second, on the issue of state charter authorizer, um, the question right now is not if there will be a bill, but rather what form it will take and whether it picks up any steam. Uh, I think there are a whole host of questions about the extent to which this concept would limit our local influence. Um, briefly, as somebody who's been around the legislature in, an, in or around it for about 20 years, I think this is frankly a dangerous moment for us. But I think that our school system, if we can get our conversations back on track, uh, can get ahead of this, this issue by working with our fellow systems in class. Um, other legislative issues that class anticipates monitoring this year include parent trigger, changes to the parent trigger law, uh, giving charter schools access to district facilities and property, again, controversial stuff, and a mandatory school start date. Um, bottom line is I think the legislature is going to keep us busy, and the more we can be thinking and acting strategically at the district levels, the more likely it is that we can avoid um, setbacks that may be in store for us otherwise. That's my personal editorial comment. Um, class will have its next membership meeting in February after the legislative bill filing deadline to review pending legislation. That's the moment where we will know for sure what's being proposed and what's not, and uh, they will alert us, and uh, I'll uh, alert everybody to the date for that meeting once it's set, and we can review um, what's actually been proposed at that time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other committee reports that did not make it to the agenda that anybody might want to throw on the table? Great. Um, I will start with the board chairman's report. I have just uh, two things. Um, I wanted to share with my board colleagues who may not be aware that I was uh, elected to serve as an at-large member of the Tennessee uh, School Boards Association uh, Board of Directors, and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it, we had our first meeting um, as a newly elected board during the TSBA convention, and a lot of what Mr. Pinkston just discussed was discussed around that table. Uh, those, the legislature is going to be extremely busy, and we need to keep our ears to the ground to make sure that we are aware of everything that is going on. Uh, there could be some significant changes made that will uh, adversely affect our children, and we want to be very careful that we are aware of everything that's coming down the pike and uh, do what we need to do um, ahead of, uh, ahead of the, uh, the legislation. Um, committee of uh, committee appointments, naming of schools. Uh, Dr. Brannon will be chair of that uh, committee. Uh, also included will be uh, Anna Shepard and Jill Spearing. Congratulations. Thank you. And I have uh, no other reports that so we will go into announcement. We announcements. We will start with Dr. Gentry. Dr. Brannon. Ms. Spearing. Uh, just a couple. Um, Gateway Elementary received a donation of $2,750 from uh, Schneider Electric. And um, David McMurtry, who works for Alta Loma, has um, been helping them uh, raise school supplies. I've been very appreciative of that. And uh, I attended uh, some information about Limitless Library. Uh, and it, it appears that 3,000 362 elementary students have library cards for the first time. So that's uh, wonderful work. And um, I, I went to uh, Pennington Elementary uh, with, uh, due to an invitation, and I was very excited. It was an open house. And two little ambassadors took us through the school, Maya and Stephen. And the most impressive thing that I saw there was their morning announcements which was WPEN radio station. They had the uh, video camera set up. The children worked on being able to be sure that they said everything correctly. Kindergarten, first grade students, it was wonderful to see the way they worked together uh, with Miss Wood and uh, Miss Jurgen. Uh, and congratulations to Chip Al uh, Sullivan, who is the athletic director of the year at Hunter's Lane High School. Ms. Kim? Ms. Shepard. I have several, but I'll keep it down to one. Um, <laughs> on Tuesday, October 30th, history was made at McGavick High School when AT&T presented a generous check in the amount of $12,000 to fund the scholarship efforts for the McGavick um, Cluster Coalition initiative. 
Um, sincere thanks to all of those who have been working very hard to make this happen. Special thanks to um, Mr. Wagner and Ms. Sager from AT&T for their generous donation. And special thanks to Mr. Randy Boyd and Chrissy Delejandro from Tennessee and Chiefs for their help and support. We're very appreciative. Mr. Pinkston? I have just two. Um, first, I'd like to say a word of thanks to Catholic Charities for inviting me to join uh, Mexican Consul General Ricardo Camara at the third annual graduation of Plaza Comunitaria in Nashville. Uh, Plaza Comunitaria is an adult ed initiative that's operating at Our Lady of Guadalupe on Nolensville Road in my district. They do a fantastic job helping new arrivals develop the language and the basic ed skills that they need to be productive members of this community. Um, that works really important to NNPS because we know that the more confident our parents are with their skills, the more success that we're going to have in helping the youngest new Americans succeed in the classroom. So I want to say thank you to my good friends, Terry Horgan, David Morales, Myra, you Morales, and others who make that program uh, a real success. Um, I'd also like to thank our colleague, Ms. Spearing, um, for recently organizing a demonstration of a first grade reading intervention at the Martin Center. Um, one of the things I'm so grateful for in serving on this board is having the opportunity to learn from professional educators like Ms. Spearing and Dr. Brandon and Ms. Kim about what actually works in the classroom. Um, I know research tells us that making sure kids are reading at grade level and early grades dramatically improves their chance of success later in life, but to witness a high quality reading intervention play out and to see a first grader improving in real time was cool. It was a privilege and it was a really nice reminder of why we're doing this. So thank you, Jill. Mr. Hayes. Uh, <coughs> I guess a couple of announcements. Um, uh, I guess beginning tomorrow, the 40th annual conference of the National Alliance of Black School Educators will be hosting a convention in Nashville bringing uh, 6,000 plus or minus educators to Davidson County. I think that's uh, great as a promoter of Nashville. Uh, and, and fellow who in, enjoys it when people come to visit. Uh, but the second piece that's really exciting and, and um, uh, what I think our board would certainly like to, to thank um, the, the NABSE and, and Prometheon for is a generous uh, gift of technology, uh, which includes uh, pen and touchscreen interactive whiteboards, which will be placed into corporate curriculum in, in uh, and support teachers in, in uh, a whole host of schools across uh, the district. So that's a really generous gift. So we, uh, I guess on behalf of this board, thank you for coming to visit our city and also for the generous uh, technology gift. Um, uh, another, I guess, announcement uh, perhaps, um, or something I'd like to say publicly, I, I recently attended um, a PTO meeting at, at JT Moore um, and, and uh, uh, it's fun. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed the last a couple of years um, spending time with parents thinking about the possibilities of, uh, of what our district holds and, and, and Mr. Pinkston, uh, you know, he alluded to excitement um, about Common Core and, and raised expectations. I certainly echo that. I'm really excited about um, the fact that we've, that, that uh, our former governor uh, has raised the standard, raised the bar. I, I, uh, I hope I ask a lot of hard questions because I want to make sure that we get there. We certainly put the, the pedal to the metal. Um, and, and so one of the things that's been really exciting is sitting with Julia Green, Percy Priest, other elementary school parents, and, and dreaming about the possibilities for growth within their schools. Uh, we'll have a capital budget before us in, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, hopefully city leaders decide that we're eligible for more capital dollars, that taxes support more capital dollars. Um, but back, back to the, the JT Moore meeting and, and, and the announcement or the hope is during the presentation uh, a group of Hillsborough cluster parents laid out a vision for what Hillsborough High School could look like uh, with capital dollars and it was a really exciting and compelling uh, presentation that, that hopefully set the, the framework for a discussion with uh, the administration, with city leaders, with uh, folks in the philanthropic community to support uh, Hillsborough. Uh, and as we look at all of our high schools, a, a lot of them are really in dire need of capital dollars. Uh, I hope that parents throughout the community at, at any high school that needs uh, a big capital infusion uh, can, can join together the way parents did in, in our cluster and begin to form a common vision for what that school looks like. Uh, if you're a Hillsboro High School alum, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to me and I'd, I'd be delighted to put you in touch with the folks who pulled it together. Uh, or any of the PTO chairs from the cluster can, can get you in touch with folks who've been working to pull this plan together because it's, it's exciting and it's a story that I think needs to be told and, and hopefully the dollars are there for it in the future so that uh, 
uh, as we meet or exceed the goals that are in front of us, uh, we can do it in facilities that are really attractive and exciting places to learn. Um, so. Thank you. Ms. Frog? Um, I just want to make one quick comment. Um, over the past few weeks, I have received numerous emails and phone calls from countless numbers of people who have um, offered their complete and unwavering support to this board for the decisions that we have been faced with over the last few months. Um, today, um, out of the blue, I had a young lady walk up to me and she said, I want to tell you to tell your board thank you. And when I asked her why, she said, because you have restored um, an energy and an excitement uh, in not only our teachers, but our community. We have people that are involved in education now who have not previously been involved because you stood your ground. Now, that is one person's opinion, but I wanted to share that with you because she says uh, she has two daughters who are educators. And everything that we do makes a difference to not just the students, but especially the educators. And she wanted to send her personal thanks to this board for standing your ground. Um, I, I shared this with you all via email. One of the things that I hear a lot about what we do as school board members is that it's a thank, it is a thankless job. I absolutely refuse to believe that uh, because every single <coughs> child, we have 81,000 plus reasons um, that we are doing a thankful job. And every time we see one of those kids graduate, every time we see one of those parents uh, pat their kids on the back or celebrate uh, an awards event, it is a thankful job. And so my personal thank you to all of you for doing what you've done over the past few months. Um, and I hope I continue to get the feedback from the community offering that thanks because they are extremely excited about this board and so am I. So that is all I have. Ms. Rowe? There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.